This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our day 32. Uh, so in our GSP Cloud Architect training. So last week we finished our stuffs with uh, a solid demo is what I would say uh, with respect to IoT core, where we saw more than three or four components used for the first time in our demo, where we used uh, a simulator IoT core, PubSub, Dataflow, BigQuery, and a hidden component was Google Cloud Storage for some staging purpose. So we had used that. So four components, uh, sorry, five components we had used for the first time uh, to see how things work. So and you see as you progress, we'll be using more components basically. And uh, in the beginning, we were using only individual component, virtual machine, that's it. Slowly, we started using virtual machine and Google Cloud Store, and we have come to a stage where we are using five components together, and we know how to connect them. So IoT Core followed by PubSub only. Uh, IoT Core followed by data flow will not happen. So because there's a dependency on for IoT Core to use a PubSub topic, only after that only you can use the next following layers, like something like a data flow or cloud functions. So if you understand that what component needs to come after other, I guess major work as a cloud architect is already done there. So we did this demo and we saw how things works, uh, how huge amount of data can be streamed. And also uh, we use some best practices of uh, uh, service account and giving uh, it a specific uh, role, all those things. So instead of using a, uh, a standard default service account, we use different, totally a different one. So that was something which we did last week. We had stopped at this slide. So we have one last component in our big data category, which is uh, data catalog. So which is basically uh, a managed service uh, for data discovery, data governance, all those purpose. And the basic purpose of this is to do metadata management, data on top of uh, data or a description of your data is going to be your metadata. So if you create a, a big query data set, you would have added it, uh, metadata information. La, what is it per, used for all those description? Similarly, if you create a big query table, you would have added some description and pops up topic when you create, you can add some description. So those things can be searched. Now data could be spread across lots of components in your GCP uh, project. So now if you want to have a single place where you can search all this metadata easily, data catalog is going to be a good choice, is a good choice. So this lays the foundation for data governance, how the data is going to be governed. So, uh, let me just quickly show you, uh, this is a little slightly a new product. So, but being aware of it is going to be really helpful. So if I go to my big data category and look into the options. So we have finished composer, data proc, uh, PubSub, data flow, IoT core, big query, uh, Looker, data fusion, uh, data prep. So things which we have not covered is life science. So which is not going to be there uh, because it's more towards healthcare, healthcare and life science. It's more and financial stuffs. So these things we are not going to cover because this is more towards uh, financial stuffs and this thing. So a specific thing. So uh, I have seen it. It's not going to come in the exam. So we are not going to look into those things. The last part which we have is uh, data catalog. So if I click on data catalog, mostly the API may not be enabled. Yeah, so data discovery and metadata management. So let me just enable uh, the API. It's going to have a, a slightly a kind of a search engine which is based on the same logic for your uh, Google Drive. So in Google Drive, you can also search, right? It is on the same logic, uh, the same search engine concept has been used behind here to search for metadata. So now this is how it looks like once you create it. Now you can search for 
various resources based on their metadata tag and also you can do some data governance saying that okay the data here is going to have some PIA information here it is going to have PCI information something related to credit card something related to personally identifiable information you'll be able to find that very very easily and the cool part is the search the search feature you just go search it and you will be able to get the necessary results so and there are some search tips which they give here so you want to search by basically if you have something with uh, say for example uh, uh, a column in your BigQuery table if you have something you can search it or you want to search for uh, a project so so if I just put that I just clicked on that search tip I searched and it is giving me a uh, few stuffs so data set which was the one which we created in a big query for the long time and last week when we created a data set called as uh, iot core it called it is called as data stream uh, it shows uh, sorry for your pub sub so uh, the data stream so it gives you that search quickly now you can also search for something else if you have a data you can put some policies how this data should be accessible all those things so a very easy way to search for stuffs one one stop shop for searching all your metadata information it can search uh, usually what i have seen google cloud storage content uh, pub sub uh, contents and big query contents easily so most of stuff. if i click on big query system equal to big query it shows me basically the data set details now if i given better description i have not given a description now you will see the value of uh, giving descriptions uh, how it could be really helpful basically so that's where uh, data catalog comes into picture uh, and you can create groups templates all those things and also certain policies which is going to really help you for your uh, data governance so small info just wanted to share that part so so that covers uh, almost all the big data products which we see in the category uh, except financial service healthcare uh, and uh, life science so which is more towards the actual sector itself healthcare sector and the financial sector so uh, we are not going through it but i have also seen that it is not coming uh at least from what i've heard and what i have seen uh there so we are just going to ignore it so that covers our big data components uh now coming back to the same slide which we started on uh i guess three or four weeks back uh, on big data now this would be more relevant now so if it's Hadoop, we know GCP has a managed version of it, which can scale up easily based on an auto scaling policy, which can be deleted automatically. There's no job for the cluster. The cluster is idle for X number of minutes or hours. It can be deep provisioned automatically, and it's going to be deep provisioned using a service account. We had seen it. Edge based big table. If it's something related to Hive job, we can use data proc itself because hive basically is more of a sql kind of a stuff you can also use bigquery but the internal workings are going to be totally different but if you know hive and you want to do the same thing in gcp data proc is a good choice because one of the kind of jobs data proc supports us hive job if you have a big statements you can again use data proc uh, but if you feel it is little old school we want to do something better more future proof you have to rewrite the entire big statements or the job which is in java into apache beam pipeline maybe using java itself if you have kafka kind of a messaging service in on-prem and you want to have zero ops you can go with cloud pubs up uh, cloud pubs up and uh, if you have spark job any streaming jobs data proc could be a good choice for lift and shift but if you want it for a future uh, proof system, if you want it to be a future proof system, data flow could be a good choice, could be a good choice. 
a quick summary now this slide which was looking like greek and latin uh, four weeks back would now be more uh, clearer is what i would say so we had seen lots of products so i just wanted to summarize uh, what comes under what category so this was based on one of the feedbacks in the previous batch so lots of products we usually get confused and that to this middle layer is going to help you out now when you take into consideration a kind of etl job so etl is going to have a source a destination or a sink and a data transformation layer in gcp you have lots of products which can do data transformation first of all uh, we'll see the sources available so when it comes to source you can use google cloud storage pubsub for streaming purpose bigquery if it's a structured data big table spanner sql server you can use or cloud sql you can use all those as source where data is kept basically so the sync can be the same thing so what you have as source can also be the sync now the most important part is the transformation layer so in what are the various various options google supports so you can write an apache beam code and run it using data flow that's the first option you need to know how to write apache beam pipeline that's one option if you are a hadoop guy uh, very well uh, comfortable writing peak statements high apache spark jobs or anything of that sort uh, data proc is a good choice now if you say i am only good at writing python code uh, if you give me some environment where i can write a standard python code and do transformation you can get something called as AI, AI platform notebook or previously called as data lab. That's one thing which you can get. Or if you say, no, I don't have any skills on programming. Give me a user driven uh, option for data transformation. You get two offerings, one from Google itself called as data fusion. The other one is a third party uh, from an organization called as Trifactor. So you use that and do the transformation now all good so you have a source you have a series or, or a combinations of various data transformation available and the data gets transformed good but if you say i want to do this transformation every day at 10 o'clock uh, 10 p.m in the night uh, the data sometimes may not come at 10 o'clock in the source it may come at 10 10 or 10 15 or sometimes at one o'clock in the morning 1 a.m so my pipeline should still execute retry mechanism should be there i should be able to orchestrate my pipeline then you are going to use a cloud composer which is going to do the orchestration for you so almost all the products which we saw you see there's a fit here so and this is the reason why these products are usually put in your big data category the volume is huge and you want to transform it all the products which you see here in data transformation was discussed in big data category big data module only composer is also going to be a part of big data only so it's going to be an orchestrator a scheduler uh, which is going to help have your pipeline built so this is a summary page folks uh, so any questions on this let me know so after this, we'll have some quick quiz and we'll move on to our module seven. Any questions, folks? Just thought of summarizing the stuffs. Uh, the composer and data flow is something where people get usually come confused. Yesterday also I was talking to one of the learners. Uh, they're a little confused. Data flow, what is composer? Managed version of airflow. So when should I use? Is it two different stuffs or they go together? I would say they would go together if you want to schedule it. Uh, you want to have this organization done. So, so this is how it looks. Any questions so far, folks? On the summary page. Okay. No questions means uh, you can turn your chat option to only to the instructor, to to me or to a private so that we'll have some quick q and a on big data basically the first question uh you need to estimate the annual cost of running a big query that is scheduled to run uh nightly so the cost estimation is what you need to do 
uh, what should you do basically so go for it two minutes Anil Kumar, Mangesh, Anil B got it correctly so far. Others? There are few options. If you don't answer that, I will be happy. Even if you make a mistake, but the mistake should not be that. Bad mistake. Ankit got it correctly. Vivek got it correctly. Last 20 seconds. Deepak Bandari got it correctly. Kumar got it correctly. I guess most of there was no wrong answer. So it is that makes me uh, happy. So good. So first option. The moment you see big query and now this is where you see the value folks why learning the command line is important so if you see the question is primarily relying on g cloud command or bq command that's what it shows basically so the moment you see big query one thing should be very clear no g cloud command we know this and we had also put this in our uh, cheat sheet if i am not wrong we had put this in our cheat sheet in a tabular form is what I remember. Yeah. So anything interacting with BigQuery, it's always BQ. Know where GCloud command comes into picture. So with that background, I would say it has to be something related to either B or D. B or D is the one which you are going to see. And we had done a demo exclusively for this purpose itself. And we had also mentioned dry run. I guess uh, even that should be in one of our cheat sheets. So where we had mentioned dry run, basically provide the query curve. So B, as most of you mentioned, makes sense. Uh, but if you have forgotten it, if you remember that it is only BQ command is the one which is going to help. So you will have instead of four options looking into four options you'll only look for b and d and just for your information you can give a try there's no command called as bq estimate it is not there so you do a dry run get the details and put it in your pricing calendar how many bytes are going to be processed then use that to get your estimate so option b as most of you mentioned is the right answer moving on to the next question uh, you are designing a storage for you are designing storage for csv files and using an io intensive custom apache spark transform so apache spark transform as part of deploying a data pipeline to google cloud you are using ansi sql to run queries for your analyst you want to support complex aggregate queries and reuse existing code what existing code i don't know you need to figure it out what is that existing code which is there currently how to transform how should you transform the input data so it's going to be a slightly a tricky question i'm going to give you three minutes go for it folks Uh, Vivek got it correctly. A uh, couple of wrong answers. Basically, focus on the one which is highlighted. This is just to give you an idea. Three wrong answers. Only one right answer from Vivek. Uh, no, wrong. Uh, 
Ankit got it correctly. Vivek and Ankit got it correctly so far. Now. I see a good amount of wrong answers and that's that's fine. We make mistakes here. Uh, no, wrong. Okay, Anil Kumar got it correctly. Anil B got it correctly. Uh, no, wrong. No. We'll spend some time demystifying this, folks. So, I guess most of you gave it a mix of right and wrong answer. Two minutes over. So instead of going with three minutes, I'll go with an explanation first so that you get an idea. So basically, it is some CSV files. Okay, that's the key part. And using an I/O intensive Apache custom transform. So basically, there's a transformation which is already written. The data transformation is already written in Apache uh, Spark. Apache Spark, it is already written. Now, as deploying, as a part of deploying the data pipeline to Google Cloud. So good. So there is a, a Apache Spark jar code already there. Now, you are using ANSI SQL to run queries for your analyst. So, so you after the transformation maybe it's getting stored somewhere in a, a database or a data warehouse kind of a stuff so you are supposed to run sql statements for your analyst basically so you want to support complex aggregate queries so looks like analysts are going to do basically some kind of reporting some aggregations simplest aggregations are going to be some average mean all those things some they want to do some more complex aggregation that's good reuse the existing code this existing code maps to basically the apache spark transforms the transformation the data transformation which is written in apache spark now they are saying basically i want to use the same code in gcp a lift and shift for apache spark tell me an option for lift and shift if i have an existing code written in apache spark spark which is basically in Scala language or PySpark or Spark SQL. I want to reuse it. Once it is transformed, it's going to go into some kind of a warehouse is what it indicates because analysts are going to do some aggregations on it. So give me a solution where uh, my Apache Spark code can run and I have an option of querying it using SQL, simple. So if you look into it, Apache Spark. So if you just go back, couple of slides back what did we see for apache spark if you want to have a lift and shift same code has to be used data proc is the one which is going to choose yes we will so it's going to be data proc so each slide has an importance so it's not just for the sake of putting it so it has a importance so anything with respect to data proc I can help use the existing code. If I use data flow, I have to write a new code, folks, uh, in Apache Beam using data flow. So because they told reuse the existing code, I'm going to look for only options which is having data proc. So B or D are the only two options which is going to work. If I'm going to go with data flow, I will not have, I have to write a, write a code and the requirement is not met. So between P and D, what is the option which is going to help me run SQL queries? Can I run di directly a SQL query on a Google Cloud storage bucket? No, only on BigQuery I can run it. So if D had Google Cloud storage with BigQuery, uh, with uh, BigQuery with data in Google Cloud storage as an external bucket, then I could have used D. But just data on Google Cloud storage, I cannot query it. It's a dumb storage system. I cannot even run a single query on it. Now, then forget about running complex aggregation queries. So it has to be B, uh, where you store your data. The last, after the transformation, you store it in BigQuery so that the analyst can run complex queries and re uh, queries. And the existing code, the Apache Spark transform code, will be run on your data proc because data proc supports Spark jobs. 
So, and I'm going to reuse it as much as possible. So, option B is a good choice. So, many of you were inclined towards data flow was the one which made it most of the time you went wrong. So, A and C uh, combination. So, hope the explanation is clear, folks. This reuse the existing code was something very important. And uh, I heard uh, from few of them the new pattern. Uh, a small trick, please look for the last ending words. Uh, so uh, someone in the you in their in the LinkedIn or somewhere I saw I saw somewhere uh, they told usually the ending words are really adding values uh, basically. So the ending words, the last few sentence, uh, reuse the existing code was a one which was helpful to make sure whether you want to use existing code or use something new if this word was not there right i would have definitely gone with uh, a as a future proof system but they told you have to use an existing code so data prop makes sense hope it's clear folks for people who got a little confused i hope it's clear now uh yes no was it clear, folks, uh, or is still there confusion? Thank you. So moving on to the next question, and please read the question. So a uh, little tricky. You are setting up data proc to perform some data transformation. Hadoop data proc. They themselves mentioned it, so you don't need to worry much there. So and you may see something of this sort, right? Now the whole purpose of putting these questions back to back is in the exam. We have seen. I have seen myself. Uh, uh, now for this product, for this option, right? For a minute, if you have made a mistake of putting A, now this assume this is the fifth question in your exam, and you get another question on data proc. This could be the forty fifth question. Uh, you read it, data proc to perform some data transform using Spark job. Now this may give you a hint. Okay, looks like mostly the job Spark jobs are written mostly are supported in data proc. If you have done this question marked for review, so you wanted to check it back one more time, then it could have given you a hint. This happens in the exam books. So this happens. Now it is very clear, usually Spark jobs are better run in data proc. Uh, so coming back to this question, you're setting up a data proc to perform data transformation using Spark, Apache Spark jobs. Good. The data will be used for uh, for a new set of non-critical experiments in your marketing team. So it's not critical. You want to set up a cluster, basically what cluster? Hadoop, a data prop cluster uh, that can transform a large amount of data in a most cost-effective way. What should you do? Go for it, folks. Kumar, Anil B got it correctly so far. Vivek got it correctly. Three of you got it correctly. One wrong answer. Anil Kumar got it correctly. Last 45 seconds, folks. Ankit got it correctly. Mangesh and Deepak Bandari got it correctly. I guess most of you gave it. So Let's look into the explanation of it. Uh, basically, Hadoop job, spa, Hadoop cluster, 
spark job and uh, it's a non critical stuff so basically this screenshot is going to be helpful for us so if it's a non critical stuff use a standard cluster type that is going to be the answer basically so uh, this is basically to indicate how even sometimes reading the cons, uh, the looking into the user interface makes good uh, amount of uh, stuffs is a key part here. So first option set a cluster type of cluster as a in a high availability mode. So because they are mentioned non-critical, so I'm not going to go with high availability. If I go with it, what's going to happen, folks? If I go with a high availability mode, what's going to happen? It's a non-critical environment. Uh, experiment. What is going to be the impact if I go with HA mode? Anybody? If I use it, what's going to happen? Cost will increase. That's it. So you're going to have three masters in your uh, in that specific uh, region. So so definitely the number of nodes increase means you have to pay an extra cost. So the cost will increase. So totally avoid A and B. Good. So then it's between a standard mode. So you have two options, standard mode. Set up a standard a cluster in a standard mode. Good. With high memory machine types and 10 additional preemptible worker nodes. So high memory machine types. Why it is high memory? So high memory can definitely increase cost, but if you see it is a spark job. Spark jobs are go usually going to be memory intensive. So giving a machine type which is high memory is going to be really helpful to run the job basically. And they are also adding 10 additional preemptible virtual machines, which is going to definitely reduce the cost because you are going to get it at 80% discount. You should be able to finish the stuff quickly and even dismantle it. So C looks like a good choice, but there's also an option D. Let's explore that also. Set up a cluster in uh, standard mode with default machine type. Default machine type is going to be what usually N1 standard four, something of that sort. Uh, and add additional local SSD disk. So if they had mentioned, uh, basically it is for some uh, input output transforms, all those kind of stuffs. Maybe a local SSD could have been better. Uh, what they have mentioned is only spark job by default spark jobs are always memory intensive so for that a memory high memory machine types is always good and 10 additional local ssd we have seen local ssds are going to be expensive uh, compared to uh, basically our balanced ssd disk or the standard persistent disk so which is going to make the solution still expensive only in option d so option c makes more sense with the kind of job which they are going to do. So the key part here is spark jobs are always memory intensive. So as most of you mentioned, C is a good choice. It's a good choice. Moving on to the next question. Uh, you plan to, your company plans to migrate a multi petabyte data to Google Cloud, a migration. The data set must be available 24 by 7 a day. Uh, your business analysts have only experience only with sql interface you want to store the data to optimize it for ease of analysis so it should be very quick folks it's a product based solution so you don't need to think much basically uh, vivek mangesh got it correctly anil b got it correctly so now you see the time which you spent in the previous you covered it now deepak bandari got it correctly this is what is going to happen ankit got it correctly Others. One wrong answer. Two wrong answers. No, 
Okay, uh, so let's go with an explanation. First of all, load the data into cloud BigQuery, uh, Google BigQuery. So it forward option, uh, petabyte. So you see petabyte of data. So definitely BigQuery can hands, uh, handle big query, uh, petabytes of data and it provides a SQL interface. Yes, so analysts who wants to just have, who have experience only in SQL interface can play around with BigQuery. Uh, the console or they can use a bi tool they should be able to do it so a looks like a straightforward option yeah so kumar got it correctly so a looks like a good option straight away but let's look into other options is there anything much better than this uh insert the data into cloud sql instance um instead of me commenting on it if anybody can comment on this it provides sql interface i have no issues uh anything else which you feel uh, BigQuery, uh, Cloud SQL is superior than BigQuery. Awesome, uh, Anil B. So anybody else wants to comment on it? So should I go or not go with SQL? Tell me one point to go or tell me one point not to go. Yes, Mangesh, uh, but the number is uh, uh, the thing. So, but the key part is the few things here. Uh, <laughs> so, couple of points which I have to say not to go with Cloud SQL as Anil B and Mangesh mentioned uh, and Ankit is mentioning. Uh, yes, the volume supported by Cloud SQL is only 30 terabytes, folks, 30 terabytes. So not petabytes. It cannot even go to petabytes. So it's multi petabyte, not one petabyte, multi petabyte. So that's one reason why I award Cloud SQL. The second reason why I award Cloud SQL is Cloud SQL is for OLTP systems, online transaction processing systems. But here, looking at the case, use case or the question, it looks like more of reporting and analytics. So it is basically an OLAP system is what they are expecting uh, without saying explicitly. So uh, OLAP system, BigQuery is an OLAP system, online analytical processing system. So if between A and B, you get a confusion, I would go with A for these two reasons to award it. So A still is the winner so far. Option C, put the flat files into cloud storage. If I put it in cloud storage, no problem. So, but the problem here is I cannot even query it. Cloud SQL is a dumb storage, as a dumb storage. So I will not be able to even play around with it. So C gets ruled out because of that. B, stream the data into data, data store. Now, whenever I hear the words uh, stream, definitely it's going to incur extra cost. That's one thing. I can keep the data in Google Cloud uh, data store, no problem. But again, the problem is the SQL interface. What data store supports, we have also seen it in our class. What it supports is basically a GQL. It's a kind of SQL, but not exactly the SQL stuff. So analysts will have troubles when they are running something to do some analysis. So it's not going to support completely a SQL statement because data store is basically a no SQL database. To make our life simple, Google has put some querying language which looks like this, uh, SQL, but it is Google query language. So with looking into those options, I would go with what most of you mentioned. A is like a good choice because it's an OLAP requirement and a petabytes of information to be uh, queried. So A is like a good choice. So that's something on our uh, big data stuff, folks. The module six is uh, finished. So what we'll do now is uh, we'll jump on to our module uh, seven which is basically on AI and a couple of them had sent me an email uh, directly. Uh, so saying that this has increased slightly more, the, the number of questions on AI in the new pattern or in the new version of uh, professional cloud architect has increased. So we'll do a little deep dive. Uh, so I used to do it always as a deep dive only. So it used to take around two hours or three hours to finish this module. So we'll do the same thing today also uh, in this batch also. So, and also some extra stuffs. Uh, I'm going to cover it so that you get an idea. And please remember uh, as a cloud architect, you are not going to write a code. 
uh, you're not going to build a machine learning model. There is going to be a specific uh, category of people who's going to do this machine learning engineers and data engineers so we are not going to do that but you as a cloud architect should know what component to use basically in your architecture so that's the whole intent of doing into looking into this ai component uh, so ai artificial intelligence so uh, a, a very vast thing a sub a subset of this is going to be what we are going to leverage and see it called as machine learning machine learning ml so this is a word which uh, Googlers use very, very often uh, called as democratized AI. So democracy kind of stuff. So equal rights for everybody. The same thing comes to here. So if you had seen this, right, basically uh, the AI, com AI stuff, all those things, you would have also heard many analysts saying some reports. Uh, AI is the, the most sexy or uh, the data scientist who basically builds AI component is going to be the sexiest job in the 20th century, in the 21st century. So the reason is it was so hot. Now also it is very hot in the market. Uh, but what Google has tried to do it is basically they have made sure it is not fixed to only some set of people who has a PhD degree or uh, uh, a degree in statistics, mathematics and statistics. It should not be only pertain to them. So what Google has done is they have created various flavors of uh, AI, uh, which could be based on your uh, skill set. You can use those things. So you could be a developer, you could be a database administrator, you could be an operation guy. You may want to learn something from the scratch, or you may be a hardcore data scientist. For each and every category, they have tried to give some of the AI capabilities. So that is why usually, if you see any AI related videos in DCP from the Google, they say Google tries to do uh, tries to democratize AI, make it available for everyone. Basically, that's the key part. And you will see soon okay. AI is going to become like more like a commodity. Uh, so everybody will use in every app. You will see AI stuff. So which you are already seeing uh, in your day to day work itself. So it's like if you are using uh, Office 365 or if you are using G Suite. Uh, Google Workspace, the moment you start typing, auto suggestion keeps coming. So Microsoft is also working on it. AWS is also working on it. GCP is also working on it. So AI is there always. The auto suggestion is a cool feature. The spam folder, you never mention anything. So, but it captures certain folders, certain emails are spammed. So it captures that. Or when you type something in your search engine, uh, if you have searched, the first query is, uh, getting started with Kubernetes. The next query, if you start typing uh, Kubernetes, it's going to show you something related to Kubernetes automatically. The prediction, what is the next word which you're going to type? So, so if you see AI or machine learning, the subset of it is already there with us. And if you are a person who uses an iPhone, so Siri is something which you would have used. If you're using an Android phone, you already use uh, the OK Google, or if you have something like uh, Alexa or Echo, the basically the Echo or your uh, Google Home, they all use machine learning built in. So that is what we are going to see in this. Uh, but before we jump into it, let's understand this uh, triangle or pyramid, whatever you want to call. So the first one, let's look at the topmost one. So ML APIs, so pre-trained models. So every cloud provider is going to provide you this in one or the other form. So what is this basically? In this context, Google would have got good amount of data. So getting data for Google should not be a difficult task. Uh, all credit goes to the search engine, uh, the Google search engine, which can crawl millions or trillions of information across the world. Use that public information, build a model. Now, what is this model usually? Uh, in my beginning days, I used to also get confusion. So treat your model as an executable force, a black box. You send something, it's going to give you an output. So how this model is built, let's not go into that detail. So it's going to be usually built by a data engineer or by a data uh, scientist. So it's like an EXE or an executable. You send some data, it's going to give an output, a prediction. So this model is already built by cloud providers like Google, and they provide you to access it via a REST API. So meaning if you have if you 
or a developer who can write code, you can call a REST API. You can use this, but you don't need to have a single knowledge of how machine learning works. You don't need to worry itself. So Google would have provided everything for you to work on this part. So this is going to be the pre-built APIs. So there are lots of APIs. We are going to talk about that. So this is going to be the one which is going to be helpful for a developer who can call REST APIs. He knows he writes web applications. He calls a REST API, gets a response. Done. So this is where uh, predefined ML APIs helps. For example, I'll just show you a small example. How it helps. So I, if I go to Now, uh, just for a minute, assume this drag and drop screen is a insurance app. I guess we would have talked this in our first day itself, uh, just a recap. So if this website is an insurance app, uh, basically, which is helpful for claiming insurance. Now, so far, uh, this is a non AI based app. So you can see how AI can be used as a low hanging fruit uh, to enter that uh, organization and make a value out of it now if it's uh basically uh an app which is going to be capturing uh, the insurance claim now if a car has met with an accident the person fills in all the details the driving the, the driver name the, the person who owns the car the the license and also definitely there's going to be one for field where you need to upload the damaged car photo now instead of uploading a car photo right the person uploads a, a two-wheeler or some other object photo the system still processes it it goes to the back end then uh, there's going to be an agent who's going to review this and call you back uh, and saying that uh, you have not uploaded the right photo you have uploaded something which is totally irrelevant so there's going to be a human involved in it and the system is not ai based now it's a web application so it is then it's done by a web developer who knows how to write web application now for him to make this work uh to turn this insurance app into an ai based insurance app what you can use is you can use a api in gcp called as vision api how it's worked let me just show you uh, let me drag and drop basically. So let me make it a little bit. So I'm going to upload this bike, folks. So if I upload this bike, cars. Uh, car, there is no car. Uh, bicycle. This is the most difficult part. Uh, bicycle is not here. Let me just refresh it. This is the most difficult part. I'm not a robot. Uh, Awesome, great job. I feel this making that capture is a great job. Now, if I have a API like this, when I upload this, it's going to definitely say the output. What is this? So it does that image analysis and says it's a, a, a two wheeler or a motorcycle. That's what it says with 97% confidence. Now, if I have a logic, I don't know what behind works behind the scene. I just need to upload it and basically use this endpoint vision.googleapis.com slash version. Maybe tomorrow version two may come. I just need to upload, uh, call this endpoint, send this in a base64 encoded form. Uh, then I'm going to get a response like this bicycle, motorcycle, something of that sort. If it is not equal to car, C-A-R, I'll simply ask the uploader who's going to upload the image, looks like that you have not uploaded a car, so please upload it. Now I am reducing the call center agent person's effort reduced here. They can spend something in more productive stuffs. 
instead of just doing a verification of the data. So this is where it can really help. Now, we have built a system which calls this API and gets a response like this, and it's going to show, please upload a card. Now the person uploads a card. Let me just upload a card. Now it sees the output is a card. It shows that it is a card. Now the form will be submitted. Now, without you as a developer knowing how this machine learning stuff works, you have built it. You have built it. So that's where this predefined API comes into picture. So a uh, AI, non-AI based app is now converted into an AI based app by a developer who knows only to write application code called Rust APIs. So that's the first category. Now, one set of category, uh, we have fulfilled their requirement. Now, the second set of category, Auto ML and BigQuery ML. So what are these things? Basically, if you are a business user or a cloud architect with zero coding knowledge, so you don't know Python, you don't know any programming language, but you still want to build a model, uh, you have a specific requirement. So in that case, Auto ML could be a good choice. For example, going back to this itself, Going back to this uh, uh, demo itself, the Vision API. What is this Vision API not able to do? Anybody can tell here, folks. What is this it's not telling further? It says it is a car, but it is not able to say something which humans can say better. Damaged. Yes. We focus more on it is a damaged car or it is uh, met with an accident. We can easily find it out as humans. So uh, all credits to our neurons, which is there in our brains. So, but the vision API has a, uh, it has, it does not have that capability or it is not trained for that basically. But if your use case is all get me. So along with the identifying it is a car, it should also say whether the car is damaged or not. So that's going to be awesome, right? So if you have such kind of a requirement, but you cannot write a code, assume uh, you want to show this kind of a proof of concept, uh, then you have an option which Google offers called as Auto ML. Anything which is Auto ML is going to be helpful for cloud architects and business users if you have the data. So if you have the sample set of data, like thousand images of damaged car, thousand images of normal car, you just upload it into an user interface. It's going to take some one hour or two hour, and it's going to give you a end point very similar to what you saw. You just upload it. It's going to show the car is damaged or not damaged. So it can give you that kind of a stuff. So zero coding. So now it covers a huge set of people who are not writing code. That's good. BigQuery ML. If you are a DBA, a, dev a database developer and with some SQL knowledge, you can also write something in BigQuery ML. So now the advantage of BigQuery ML is going to be the data stays in BigQuery itself. You run machine learning stuff and do the prediction. Do the prediction, like going back to our IoT core example, BigQuery ML could have been a good choice. So you have lots of historical data. You say whether the vehicle is going to go for a maintenance or not. It's going to break down based on the prediction. So DBAs are also covered. So developer, People who don't have programming knowledge is covered. Developer or uh, database developers are also covered. Good. The next part, ML engine, cloud ML engine. Now it is called as AI platform. Is the one which covers uh, the most uh, niche set of people, basically the data engineers and data scientists who have uh, massive Python expertise, but they only have Python expertise. If you ask them to manage the infrastructure, they cannot. So you have to provide them something which is no ops, basically a managed service. So that's where you get something called as AI platform or cloud ML engine. So previously it was called as cloud ML engine. So now they call it as AI platform. So another set of category, we have covered it. Now, as a data engineer, you would have done everything uh, or data scientist, you have done everything. The model is working fine, beautiful. but there's going to be some operation works involved. So it may not always need to work in GCP only. It should also work in on-premise. It may should also work. The model which you build should also work in uh, what? In AWS Azure also. So that 
operation work, platform agnosticness, all should be there. So for that, you get an offering from GCP, which is again based on open source Kubernetes stuff called as Kubeflow. Now you see how Kubernetes comes everywhere, folks. The containerization concept comes everywhere. So it's all based on Kubernetes and it is now called as ML Ops. Um, maybe um, one of my uh, senior folks was saying this. Uh, machine learning is going to become commodity. Next few years, you'll see. And the one which is going to really rock is how do you operationalize your machine learning model? So a model usually works in a data scientist laptop very well. But if you want to operationalize it, work, handle a huge amount of load, definitely you need to have ML ops. So this is going to be a very uh, high in demand in the next few coming years, basically. So maybe an exposure on Kubernetes is going to definitely help basically people to get this kind of roles. So Kubeflow, yeah. so now you operationalize it also, you are going to get it. So for DevOps or ML ops kind of people also, you have an option covered. The last one is basically, uh, where you are a data scientist with a very vast Python skill set. Why Python? Because usually machine learning goes, most of the libraries built are for Python only. So even not for Java, it's very limited. Uh, anything which you have heard on machine learning, most of the time they think it is always Python language or R language. Only these two things. Python is really uh, rocking with respect to the machine learning stuff. So, if you are okay to use an infrastructure like a virtual machine, you want to get full control of it, not a managed version, you use deep learning VM engines. So it's basically from your marketplace, you can get a, a deep learning uh, VM images where it's going to have Python installed, uh, Python installed, uh, lots of other components built in. So you don't need to do much of an installation, you can just go use it. But but you have full control to your virtual machine, what component you want to install it. So in the managed version, you may have some limitations. So if you see major portions of the people are covered, categories of people, a developer, uh, a business user, a data science, uh, engineer, uh, sorry, a data cloud architect, data engineer, data scientist, uh, operational uh, ML ops uh, with exposure of machine learning, exposure of uh, infrastructure and no exposure of expo uh, infrastructure and also DBA. Everybody is covered. So that's the reason why Google calls, uh, they try to democratize AI. So uh, what we'll do is we'll spend some good amount of time on all of these things and also try to do a demo without writing much of a code. So, so much of a code. So smartly we'll try to play around. So before we do that, we'll take a 10 minutes break, come back, once we come back, We'll first look into the first part, the predefined APIs. There are good amount of predefined APIs. All are going to be called via REST APIs. So we'll explore more on this. This could be something important from, that's what I heard from one of the persons. So he got good amount of questions on AI, not from the code perspective, but from the uh, what product to use basically. So let's take a 10 minutes break, come back and then explore this part. Stop the recording. This conference will now be recorded. So before the break, we saw at a high level uh, the details, various offerings in AI when it comes to GCP. And using that only, it is trying to democratize AI. So the predefined APIs, AutoML, BigQuery ML, then how uh, AI platform is working is what we saw at a very, very high level and introductions uh, stuff. Now we'll see some of the predefined APIs works first and, I, and we'll see how it works also. We'll do a demonstration also. And in none of the demonstration, we are going to write a code. So, so you should be able to do it if you're not coming from the programming background still. So the first product, under the predefined API or predefined ML API is the model is already built. You just need to pass a necessary input. You're going to get an output basically because it's a vision. It's going to be more related to images. 
So you upload an image, it's going to give you some insights about the image. Now, it could be the image could be a barcode, it could be a scanned PDF document, it can do an optical character recognition, or it could be a face, it can detect the faces there in that image, or it can also find out uh, landmarks, logos, or it can also go ahead to an advanced level and find out is it a uh, uh, is there any uh, is it a fake image it can do that also it can also identify whether there's any violence in the uh, image some blood kind of a stuff it can also relate capture any adult related content is there it can do that also so by looking into the exposure of skin it can say whether this is uh, adult related content or a non adult related content so it can do various stuff uh, one predefined API. You just upload it, it's going to do it, basically. And all these things are going to be via a REST API. REST API. So let's do some series of demo on this to understand it. So going back to the same example, which we had tried, a car was uploaded. Now it told it was nine, uh, 50, 91%. Uh, it is a car. That's good. Now, apart from that car, what it, else it has detected is it is able to detect a local folks. That's very cool. And uh, if you click on this, it says wheels are also detected. That's good. Now, if I just zoom this, after zooming it, then we will come to know it's yes, it's a Nissan logo. So things which we were not even looking at, we are able to capture it, the logo is captured so this is a good one so this is a good one and let's see a small demonstration on uh, type safe search so it also shows is there any adult related content no. is it spoop no is it medical no violence or racing so unlikely it is that's good now let me upload one more image uh, so everybody knows it's a Taj Mahal but I have purposely renamed it as twin tower just to confuse the system thinking i'm smart i'm trying to confuse the system uh, where i'm going to put basically why i cannot see a larger image of this extra large icon okay that is the max i can see so it's a Taj Mahal, but the name is different let me see what is going to happen so without me doing anything it says it is Taj Mahal, uh 60 percent accurate and it also tells because it's Google APIs are there. So it can also capture and say the location of it, the landmark easily. And again, all is based on basically uh, the same REST API. So cool feature, right? Cool feature. Now, let me show you one more thing uh, where it looks sometimes, some of the images may look alike the same thing. For example, this one so quickly looking uh, uh, it may look like a eiffel tower in paris but this is not an eiffel tower in paris but this is a hotel uh, in las vegas this is where most of the google sales kickoff happens so so this is the image so let me just upload it looks like quickly first shot if humans also see they may say it is eiffel tower but system is very smart it says uh, Las Vegas, so Paris, Las Vegas. That's the name of the hotel. Uh, it is what it shows. So even if you try to upload look-alike kind of an image, it is able to find out uh, landmarks very accurately, 83% accurate. That's a good one. So, and you're not doing any training or anything, folks. You just send your information, it's going to give you a response, basically. That's a cool one. So the landmark stuff is good. So let me show you one more demo, which you can also try running it. It's in your bookmarks, uh, Vision API Cloud Vision Explorer. This is built by Googlers, so they use it for some demonstration purpose. So let's try to see one of them. I'm going to use this. It's a nice user interface, actually. Uh, they have built something very just. Now this is. If you see this something like this, uh, humans are able to detect it very beautifully. Uh, it is a stadium and people who have watched 
or are they fan of baseball? They'll say it's a baseball. Uh, but most of us are able to say this is a stadium. The same thing is if you give it to a vision API, what are the stuff it is able to detect without you doing anything much stuff further? It says it's a game stadium. Awesome. It's team sports because there are lots of players here. It's not one player playing. So team sports, it's not like your uh, tennis or something where only two people are there. It's a team sports ball game, baseball equipment. The reason is it may look very similar to a cricket stadium, but cricket stadium will have a pitch in the middle but baseball will have it at a corner. So based on those understanding, it has got it. So usually the machine learning is going to be built over a period. So based on the amount of data which you provide, it's like same thing like uh, more information you provide to a small child. I have seen this uh, working uh, in a child usually like uh, if you have a child uh, which is very young or your relative's child, you'll easily observe it. Like if you just give, uh, for example, one apple and one orange, the child may not be able to differentiate very well. But if you give some different number, good number, small apples, like something like a smaller version of an apple, a bigger apple, a green color apple and an apple which is in a normal red color. So and orange in different uh, size and uh, color, the child will understand, okay, these are different stuffs. Later, when you give a new data or a new fruit, it's going to say, uh, like if you give a kiwi fruit, it can say definitely it's not an apple, it's not an orange. But if you give something which is an apple, it can identify and say it is an apple. So the reason is behind in the child's mind, this neurons are getting connected. The model gets visualized, uh, stored, and it's now able to, it has built a model in our brain and it's able to identify this is an apple, this is an orange, and this is something not an apple, not an orange. So that is the kind of stuff. Usually people do it even in uh, machine learning stuff, the real machine learning stuff. And just for your information, AI components or AI capabilities was there in 1950s itself, where none of us were born. Uh, so, but it was not used extensively. The reason was there was no powerful infrastructure. Now with cloud coming into picture, everybody can create machine learning model, powerful model, because you can get infrastructure very easy. So all credit goes to the cloud. So coming back here, how the system is able to identify is based on the amount of data you provide. More the data you provide, better the system is going to work. So with the amount of information provided, it is able to quickly say it's a game uh, stadium, baseball equipment, so all those things. That's good. It's so not only these things, it has gone ahead and tried to capture a few more stuffs. OCR, optical character recognition. You see Pepsi, Cola, City Field, Let's Go. These are all text, right? So it has done this. It has captured it. City Field, Let's Go. So that's really good. That's really good, uh, which has captured it. So text also can be captured. Awesome. Now it is also saying I have captured a face. I'm not able to find a face in this image, but the system has captured a face. If you want to turn on that, you just click on this. It shows on the scoreboard or on the name board, whatever you want to call. So it says there is a person called as Ruben Jad, uh, Tejda, Tej, Tejda. So that's the name of the player and it shows there's a face in there and he is in a joyful mode, a smiling face. So that's really cool. That's really cool, which it shows. And it also shows whether he's wearing a headwear, a cap or not. Yes, if I see it, usually players wear a headwear. It shows, yes, likely it has been worn. That's really good. And it goes again to get the details. It is a city field stadium in New York, basically. And same stuff, any inappropriate content is there or not. It's going to show that. So you can use this for various purpose. Like uh, I have seen uh, employees, yeah, sorry, employers using this to scan if there's any uh, inappropriate content stored in the employee's laptop. So they can scan this for any inappropriate content and uh, delete it. So this could be used. So it's a very cool feature which you can use when it comes to 
other vision part and everything is using a simple api call basically so but what this vision api cannot do is anything which is damaged folks anything which is damaged so something like a damaged car it cannot see and um, usually um, i have positioned this to some customers and the way i do this to the customers to demonstrate now uh, you need to have an image what will people usually do they go to google images get an image and upload it now if you show this to a customer the customer will say it's anyway google images google dot and some uh, magic behind it uh, so what i usually do is i don't go to google search engine but i go to bing bing.com which is a search engine from microsoft so i search here the stuff and try to show the demonstration so the two different systems and show how it works for example uh, a damaged carton so these days everybody gets uh, boxes uh, delivered so if you want to see a damaged carton so i'm going to get one this one uh, yeah this is a good one uh, i'll just copy this to my local system folks uh, demo that's it now if i upload this into my vision api let's see what it shows we are very sure it's not able to find out the damage stuff uh, it just says box that's it but it does not have the capability of finding out damage stuff which we will see how we can handle it using auto ml so the reason for highlighting this is you may get questions on this kind of a stuff uh, you want you have an e-commerce business and you want to find out the cartons which is going to be damaged uh, before it is going to be delivered so put it on a on a, a device which keeps scanning so you may have a camera which scans uh, so scans if there's damage you don't deliver it if it's not damaged you deliver it so to find it out vision api could be one of the options which cannot fulfill this auto ml vision api is the one which is going to fulfill it we'll see that option soon once we finish the remaining demo so but this should be very clear folks vision api simple vision api basically the predefined ml api will not fulfill our requirement but it can just say it's a box okay so Moving on to the next pre-built API, uh, which is one of my favorite one, uh, speech to text. Uh, speech to text uh, basically is what we are using in most of our phones uh, these days, Siri or your OK Google uh, or Alexa or your, uh, sorry, Echo or your uh, Google Home. So where the audio is converted into a, a textual form why it is important you may think of so um, i can just share a real example here which i did uh, implement in for one of the customers but not using not using gcp but using a different product but the concept is the same uh, the use case was uh, uh, this was almost like three years back actually uh, the use case was in this organization uh, they were using microsoft uh, suite of tools and skype for business was heavily used and every meeting they used to record the session so how we do it these days everything online so they were doing it uh, three years back itself so three three and a half years back so they do the recording and usually meetings would be 30 minutes or one hour usually that's a typical uh, time duration so the size of this recorded video uh, with audio all those things used to come to around rough to roughly around 100 mb to 150 or 200 mb uh, the problem was once they record it, they keep it, it was becoming a huge volume of data and nobody was going and looking into the recordings. That's the reality. They understood it. Uh, if they usually the reason for recording it is if there are 10 members who are supposed to attend the meeting, only five turn up. Uh, so because of a conflict, the remaining five can look into the recording later. That was the stuff they should have done. So uh, to to do that, they record it, but these people don't look into the record. So they always look for summary minutes of the meeting. So with this being the pain point, so when they reached out to uh, our organization, so it was Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So 
I was a pre-sales person. So I looked into the requirement and gave a solution which can do a speech to text. So if it's a 30 uh, one hour recording, you may have 200 MB of file files. Now, if I generate a text transcript of it, basically it's a textual data. So it's going to be few KBs. So like maybe roughly around uh, 200 or 300 KB of data. So now this data, textual data, I send it to a analytical system, uh, NLP system, natural language processing system. It's going to generate a minutes of the meeting. Now, from a audio, I got a speech transcript and the entire one hour audio content is now in a textual format. Easy for search also. I can send it to a search engine and search what people talked. If they have talked about Google Cloud, maybe at the 20th minute, 30th second, it will take me to that point and start playing the video. That is something possible. And also I can generate a summary summary of it and share the minutes of the meeting. So this was something implemented for this organization and they still use it, which reduced their storage footprint. So the moment the recording happens, it's going to be put into a folder, a hot folder. It's going to scan this folder, do a speech to text transcript and basically generate the minutes of the meeting and delete this audio uh, recording itself. So that was a solution which was proposed. So. And it was not that accurate, folks. Let me be very straightforward. It was around 75% accurate. When it comes to Google, right, the accuracy is awesome. So they come close to 98% accuracy. And uh, the product which I used had a requirement like it has to be something like more like a, a studio environment. So if it's like studio, it's going to be very easily doing the transcript. The accuracy goes up to 85. But with Google speech to text, you can be in a very traffic uh place there are lots of background noises there but still system is able to recognize your voice and it can search it for your stuffs so that's the level of accuracy which google has done the reason is this machine learning is using not using there's a concept called as acoustics so so but google uses uh, something called as uh, neural networks so they use neural networks. This is the best way of building a model. So uh, the, more, the product which I used was based on a uh, grammar file. So I have to add good amount of content, then only it's going to detect it. So if I say some special word, which is not there in the dictionary, it's not going to do a speech to text transcript. But with neural networks, even if I use a, a new term, it's going to recognize it with the help of acoustics. So that's the cool feature of it. And maybe Basically, uh, Google supports close to 120 languages. Uh, dialect is very, very important here. Uh, the accent, basically. So um, speech to text in Google can support uh, Indian version of English, uh, different accents of English, Australian, uh, Singaporean uh, accent of English, US uh, English, uh, UK version of English, they can support different accents easily. And when it comes to Indian languages, uh, up to nine Indian languages it supports. If you can speak uh, these Indian languages, you can give a try yourself and it's going to work basically. Um, languages are Bengali um, in the alphabetical order. Bengali, English, Gujarati, Kannada, Malayalam, Marathi, Tamil, uh, Telugu, Hindi. It can handle all this kind of languages easily. You can give a try yourself. It works very awesome. So I had also done a video very long back. Um, let's see whether that is something possible to show. Let's see, they added that feature basically. Uh, so if I just go to my speech to text. Uh, okay, they microphone we can give this so this was something which they have added it so let me try doing it so different accents of english so you see the indian versions of it so if i say use hindi i guess most of you can understand hindi if i just use is there a search option h they had removed this feature. Uh, now they have added it back. 
dashing hindi uh, h h am i missing hindi somewhere bharat this one what kind of people are you able to find it folks ah, okay hindi okay so if it's uh, my english hindi is not going to be that super good so uh, so but let me try to speak and see how it works so start now you have to allow it car uh, नमस्कार मेरा नाम महेश कुमार मैं बैंगलोर का निवासी हूँ uh bangalore was not correct if i'm not wrong so let me give a try one more time so namaskar mera naam mahesh kumar main bangalore ka nivasi hu so i copy this and if i don't know hindi uh, i can go and do a translation I can use a translate API and paste the content in translate API and get the output. Or you can also use the same translation which you have. So something like uh, Google Translate. The same thing is what powers even your translation API. So you can paste your stuff. Uh, so which is really good. So which is really good. And this API, right, uh, speech to text is really cool, folks. I have also tried to uh, long back. I have tried to sing a song also. So it captures that speech. You can look at it at a later point of time, this recording. So um, so, so I have sing Hindi, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu songs, and it is able to basically detect all those things. So so I have sung uh, Akele hum, akele tum. So this is from Raja Koran. Okay, that song from Americans movie. So it is able to do it. So, so Raja Koran is that song. So that it is able to do it. The same thing I have done it for other languages. It has done very well. So you can. So and the translation is also good. So Raja has fallen in love with the queen at the first sight. So which is really a cool one. So you can use this for multiple use cases. So. Something like, uh, uh, say for example, broadcast. So broadcast uh, agent uh, organizations like uh, CNBC, uh, BBC broadcast, uh, NDTV, lots of uh, broadcast organizations. They have lots of recordings, but if they were to search it, they usually do a meta tagging. But here you do a complete speech to text. It's going to be easy for you to search the content. So that is something like, say, for example, if it's a cookery show and if the chef says put two tablespoons of sugar in the 28th minute or in the 10th minute. So if you just search for sugar, it's going to take you to that specific timestamp and make it searchable and you will go and play from it there. So that's a cool option which you get with speech to text option. So and this is the same thing which is used by your uh, OK Google or Google Home or by your uh, uh, echo uh, amazon echo so different api different uh built-in models but this is the key part so it does a speech to text now if you say uh, hey google tell me the weather in bangalore so the audio gets converted into text from the text it's going to capture what is the weather uh, which city it is mentioned bangalore capture bangalore and call the weather api and get the response that stuff what it's going to do basically it's going to say use the reverse of it text to speech and say the weather in bangalore or whatever the place it's going to say xyz uh, celsius or fahrenheit it's what it's going to show so that's where speech to text comes into picture 
uh, I almost like 10, uh, 10 years I spent on this itself, uh, different products. And I really see the value of Google there. Um, so the products which I used in the past was only 75 to 85% accurate. And if it's not a studio environment, the accuracy drops very bad to 50%. But Google, even if you're in a noisy environment, the accuracy is awesome. Accuracy is awesome. And if you use Google Meet, there's an option for you to see the uh, caption. If you turn on, you can see that caption turned on. It's going to do live speech to text. And even most of the videos which I do, uh, I usually don't turn on, I don't write a subtitle for it. So after a day, the same video, if I go and see, you'll see a subtitle for it. So I would say it is going to be a little good accurate. So you can use this for creating subtitles also. For example, I've heard many of them like to see Korean movies, but if you don't understand Korean movies, so these days with the OTT, you get subtitle automatically. And there are lots of organizations who generate OTT, uh, like subtitle for it. This could be a solution which can be provided. So use basically a Korean audio, send it to speech to text, you get it in Korean, uh language then do a translate api like this which we just saw i'll also show you a demonstration live use a translate api uh get it in english now add it in your subtitle so you have lots of tools to merge your text with your audio now uh, video now you can have a subtitle generated so instead of relying on a normal uh a person to listen into the entire video and do a, a subtitle for it you can use this one so there are lots of options which you can use and these apis can be uh, connected so can be connected also basically that's a cool part of translation api so and speech to text api and translation api i don't have this option of trying it uh trying it here, so if I just go, it does not show me that option, uh, a small quick option to check it. So I don't get it. What I will do is I'll show you a different option altogether. How do you do this now? Speech to text, there was a user interface for me to try it out. Now, if you want to show it to the customer quickly, you can just go to this website and turn this on and work. it works. But if it's some APIs, they don't provide it. Let me see whether they provide it. They don't have the option to quickly test it. So you have to write some code or something, but we don't want to write a code. So how will I do it? So for that, I'm going to use something called as Postman. So Postman is a very good utility for testing your uh, REST APIs, and you don't need to write code here. So what I have done is uh, for your benefit, If you go to your uh, module seven, the AI uh, stuff, I have a JSON file, uh, which is basically the Postman uh, configurations. I have exported it. So I'm just going to download it. Now uh, it's a JSON file. If you're interested, you can just go look into the JSON file and see how it looks like. Uh, basically you can see the stuffs. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically import that JSON file. So make it big. I don't have anything currently. So I'm going to import it. So from my local system. So it's import. Now uh, it's going to show you some of the APIs which we are going to use in our demonstration. So translation API. So it says, this is how we are. I cannot zoom this folks further. So I oh, let me try zooming. Yeah, I can zoom. So this is the end point. Like how for your vision API, you had vision.googleapis.com. For translation API also, you have an end point. So you have to call it like this, translation.googleapis.com, the language which you want, and the API key. Now is the real key part. Now everything which you're going to do is going to be a cost. So Google is going to provide you this capability. If you want to do it in a production system, you can definitely not use this option, right? You cannot come here and do it. This is for a quick check. Uh, so similarly, you cannot use this part. 
it is in the website itself. If you want to do it every time in a batch process or something, you have to turn on the APIs, get the key, API key and use it. So how to do it? Let me show you. So let me just go. And if you look into our AI category, AI artificial intelligence category, what you see is vision, translation. These are all auto ML version of it. So you don't get the translation API directly in, in this category. So if I just go to translation, this is if you want to create your own translation model using auto ML, auto ML translation model. So what you need to do is basically go to your APIs library, search for translation API. Translation API. Enable it, then create an API key for it. So let me enable this. And the next demo which we are going to do is also on natural language processing, NLP. So on a textual data, what can you do? Can you find sentiment analysis, all those things? So I can do that. So I'll try to get another API, enable that, which is NLP, natural language. Okay, I have to search for it. Natural, natural language API. So enable this also. done two apis are enabled now i have to give a key so the way i'm going to generate it is we have seen how to create a service account generate a key for it which is going to be key uh, dot json format so we are going to generate a credentials but not service account this time we are going to use api key because we have never created an api key so let's create it so click on your credentials you'll see lots of options service account we have already tried it uh, so uh, API key will let's try to explore it. So API key. So it's going to show the key. You don't need to keep a copy of this key anywhere. It's going to always show it. Uh, so, but make sure you restrict the key, the usage of this key. Uh, that's very important. It's going to show you a warning that uh, this is unrestricted. So in a production, it is not recommended. So you need to restrict it. Meaning, what do you mean by restrict? This key should be only used by Translation API and natural language API. It should not be used by speech to text API, is what you are going to say. So, how do I do that? Restrict it. So, say this as uh, ML predefined API keys. Now, it can be accessed by a web application, any kind of application. Application wise, I'm not going to put a restriction, but API wise, what APIs can be enabled? So can be used, uh, can use this API, restrict it. You will have the list of APIs. So translation is what I want it to be used. Good. Now one more. So if I use what? Uh, Natural language. Done. It's going to be used only by two APIs. That's it. Which is going to be really a cool one and restricting it. If I try with some other API, it's going to throw an error. I'll show you that demonstration also. Now the key, it's always going to be available here, folks. So copy this. I'll go to my uh, postman. And this format is a template, is a template you need to give it as an environment variable. So how do I do it in, and I can just paste it here directly also. It is going to work. But if you are going to use it in multiple places, use a template or a global variable. So you should be able to see uh, the global variable here. Environment variables, add, let me add API key. What was the name? Let me see it. API key. So API key and uh, 
current value is this one. Now I have added it, save it. Now if I go, it should be just mouse overing and it's going to show, yes, this is available. So I don't need to pass the key continuously for every call. I put it in an environment variable, I accept it. Good, now I have a translation stuff. Now let me basically see what are the stuffs which you need to send as a details. So basically you need to send a content, a body, because it's going to be post request. You are going to submit something. It's going to be of type post. And what is the language you want to do it? So Namaskar, me Mahesh Kumar, me Bangalore ka Nivasi So that's the same stuff which I told. So the source is in Hindi. The destination, uh, the target is in English. So let's try to see it. So send a request. It's going to do a post request. And if things are all fine, if my key is valid, it's going to give me a response 200. And the translated content is, hi, I am Mahesh Kumar. I am resident of Bangalore. Awesome. So this is how you do it. Now, if you want to see it uh, in a different language, people who can talk Spanish, you can change it to Spanish, uh, ES, send a request. So this is what it shows. So I don't speak Spanish. I'm going to copy this and put it into my translate. Uh, you don't know that, you can put it back here. This is the content. The source is Spanish and I want the destination in English. Now try this. Awesome, you got it. So you did not go to Google Translate and do it. You did everything using API. Beautiful, you can show this. Now if the customer says, can you have a small code for a proof of concept? And you as a cloud architect are not comfortable. What you can do is cloud, uh, sorry, Postman comes very handy with it. What is that feature which you can get with Postman is it is also going to give you a small snippet of the code. So if you look into this option, it gives you this code option, folks. Uh, can I collapse this? So it gives you options to write code in various languages, various languages like Python. If you were to write this code in Python, this is how you should send it, basically. Just copy it, run it. Or you want it, if the customer says, can we get it in Node.js, you get it in Node.js native. Now, without you writing a code, a code is generated for you. So done, copy it, just run Node.js, this file name, it's going to work. So that's a beautiful option which you get with uh, Postman. I use this very heavily uh, when you are testing something with your APIs. And we'll talk also about something called as endpoints in our module eight which could be really helpful for you to test it out. So any questions on this part, folks? How do you test it really, uh, the end uh, endpoints uh, of these APIs? So uh, that's on something on your translation API. So we are trying to see how you can use it in the portal itself or the website itself, how it works. And if you want to try something which is uh, via the API, we saw how it works. Uh, now, let me show you what happens if speech-to-text uses the same API. So you see the API is there. Now, now we saw how speech-to-text works. Here, the endpoint is going to be speech.googleapis.com. So I have a audio which is in Google Cloud storage bucket. Uh, about something about uh, Brooklyn. So I can try to send a request and see what is going to happen. Because this API is not uh, authorized to use the key, let's see what is going to happen. So send forbidden. The speech API has not been enabled in the project uh, before or it is disabled. Try enabling it is what they are saying. Okay, so this is not related to the key. So they are saying the API is not enabled. Okay, let me go ahead and enable the API. Speech to text. 
Waiting for the API to be enabled. Okay, the API is enabled. Now let me send it to my uh, specific uh, endpoint and see what is going to happen. Now it shows uh, API is not enabled, it's not going to show, but it's going to show request to this API was blocked. Why? Because the API key, I have blocked it. So I have restricted it to be used only by uh, translation API and natural language API. Uh, so if you enable it only, this is going to come. So to enable it, go back to your credentials. Go back to your credentials, edit this, and make sure you add speech to text also. Allow speech to text if you want to allow. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong one. Uh, where do I see my keys? Uh, oh, sorry, one, one, uh, API credentials. Okay, I click on edit. I add one more key, which is speech. Save it. Now, if you see, this is going to be basically a restriction security. So definitely a part which a cloud architect is going to play. So only three APIs are allowed. Now, this time when I do it, I should get not a client error, uh, a 200 OK response is what I should get. Let me see. Awesome, I get it. So how old is uh, Brooklyn Bridge? That's the audio which is going to be used. So the audio content is coming from a Google Cloud Storage. Okay. So this is how you can restrict your APIs and call your stuff using APIs, using APIs. So let's go to the next part. Uh, you had an audio content. You got it into, say, for example, if it's a, a Korean content, you like a movie. It's a very old movie. So nobody has even generated a subtitle for it. So from the Korean movie, you generated a, a Korean content, textual content that you send to translation API. Awesome. You send it. You got a English transcript. Then some of them you wanted to find basically uh, the content you some sentiment out of it. If you were to find it out, there are some options uh, which we'll see like in natural language APIs and all. So before that, uh, we'll see this part. I guess I was supposed to do this. I was not aware that I've added this slide. So speech, text to speech is a reverse of it, folks. Uh, reverse of it, where if you have a textual content, it's going to show you the output, give you an audio output. So Alexa, uh, sorry, uh, Echo, uh, AW, like Amazon Echo or OK or Google Home or OK Google Siri, all those things, they use both the stuffs, speech to text and text to speech. So you give, when you give an input, it's going to be speech to text that gets in, converted into a textual format that is going to do some processing and the output is going to be sent back as an audio to you saying that the weather report in Mangalore today is so and so. So this is going to be used and it is going to be more like a human kind of a voice, but it's limited currently around 20 plus languages only it supports. Uh, uh, this could be one possible use case where people who are not comfortable uh, using a specific language but they create a textual transcript. They want it to be converted into a la audio. For example, simple use case, you would have seen many YouTube uh, mm -hmm. YouTubers where they are not comfortable specific speaking a specific language. So what they do is they open up a notepad and they say the steps. Instead of putting it in a notepad, you put the same thing in notepad and send it to speech to text to speech. It's going to generate an audio for you and you just sync your audio and your video there are lots of tools. FFmpeg is something possible. You can also use cloud functions to merge these two things and have a video which can have both the visual aid and also the uh, audio stuff on. 
So that's where text to speech comes into picture. This is one of my favorite one uh, natural language API. So you did lots of uh, unstructured information to semi-structured form. So or to some textual form that was really good audio. You converted into a textual form. Now what was mentioned in that text? Is it positive thing or something a mixed opinion or it was totally negative concern? You can easily find out sentiment analysis using natural language API. So, uh, and it can also find out entities. What do you mean by entities? Now, if you mention something about uh, a specific country, about a specific uh, personality, uh, person name, it's going to identify and say, this is a name, this is a country. So this is a, a, a designation. It can find those kind of entities also. For example, if you use the same example of speech to text, if you say, uh, hey, Google, tell me the uh, location in Bangalore. Now it should find out Bangalore is the entity, it's a city. Now this part should be sent to a weather API, find out what is the weather in Bangalore, get the output, then you use your text to speech. So you can see how you can chain all these APIs together. So this is going to be very important natural language API from the exam perspective. The reason is there is a case study new case study uh, which we will definitely talk about it but just wanted to highlight it uh, helicopter racing so if i search for sentiment crowd sentiment so to find out it's basically something i more like a, our ipl kind of a stuff uh, but uh, plays are not going it's, it's going to be helicopters so crowd sentiment you want to find out the sentiment of the uh, audience so Definitely, your natural language API is going to help you out to find out the sentiment. So we'll do a quick demonstration on this to show how it works in two different styles. One using the website itself and one using our Rust API, using our Postman. So let me just close this. So the same thing. So you are going to have an API endpoint called as language.googleapis.com. You mention it. That's it. So you can pass a text like this. A text like this. Uh, Michelangelo, an Italian painter, uh, is known for the calling of Saint Matthew. This is a text. Now API is valid. It is also enabled. I just send a uh, response. Sorry, uh, send a request. I'm going to get a response. And what you are trying to analyze is only get me the entities. Just get me the entities. That's enough. So the entities here are going to be name, a person name, Michelangelo, uh, location, Italian, it shows that, event, calling of uh, saints. So you get every response in a JSON format. This is one thing. This is one thing. Now, uh, if you want to analyze the sentiment, so let me just try to do it. Uh, so I was in uh, Delhi airport uh, terminal number three uh, last year. That's it. So this is my content. So I put a tweet or a Facebook message. Now, if you want to do some analysis on this kind of a stuff, what is going to do is I'm going to change this to uh, if I just do entity, it's going to find out Delhi is a location. So let me just do the entity stuff. Delhi airport. Location. It shows me the location. That's good. Now, if I want to analyze the sentiment, I use a different this thing configuration sentiment analyze sentiment now as a human when we see this looks like a neutral actually i would say it's a neither positive neither negative it's neutral but sometimes people have this habit of using short form uh, i here wanted to indicate its number 
but uh, people have the short form of putting NO. So when you send this kind of a stuff to uh, the system, it is going to say the score is minus. Minus indicates the negative sentiment. Why is basically because you mentioned the word no. But your intent was to indicate it's a number, uh, terminal number three. Uh, so sometimes I wanted to show you, I don't want to show you everything which is working. So sometimes if you use a, a short forms, colloquial languages, your sentiment analysis may not be really good. Uh, so you have to train it. So to train it, you use an auto ML version of it. Whenever your free bit APIs cannot do it, you have an auto ML version of it. So auto ML vision, auto ML translation API, auto ML natural language API. So you get that option. So if I remove this uh, and use number, I'll just remove that itself. And let's see what is the sentiment. Now, previously it was negative, score was negative. Now let me see what is going to happen. It should be neutral basically. Till, uh, okay, minus, uh, maybe the last is the word which is creating a problem. Let me see it. I was, I don't know what is the reason why it is negative. I was in Delhi airport terminal three. Okay, I don't know how it works now. It is little tricky here. So the content was showing now it is zero. Now if I create something like this, I worked in XYZ company and they take care of their employees providing a better better uh, uh, guidance and support so which is mostly uh i would recommend my company for uh for everyone so basically a positive sentiment so if i send this request you see the score is positive 0.8 so which gives that how you can do sentiment analysis easily with it sentiment analysis easily with it so this could be important from the exam perspective so because there's a case study also now, if you want to see the same thing quickly in a user interface uh, to show it to the customer, so because you don't want to generate keep, use postman, all those things, just go to your natural language API bookmark page and you will see a option there, which is more about Google stuff and Sundar Pichai. So there are lots of stuff. Google is a company name. Uh, Mountain View is a location. Sundar Pichai is the name of the person. Android is a product name. So it can analyze the sentiment. It can analyze the entities. It can also analyze the grammar folks. That's the cool feature of it. So you can position this to some kind of educational uh, institution, basically uh, traffic signal. Where else it is? Okay. Okay, this is the only pain point of using this one. Uh, man, uh, am I missing anywhere? Hydrant is easy for me. Um, one moment, I'll let me refresh it, folks. This is the only bad part, I would say. Uh, so that's the reason I use a postman to show easy demonstrations. Uh, and you don't want to do this in front of a customer. Bicycle. 
car process very easy. Okay, uh, I am not sure whether I'll be successful. Okay, I guess I don't want to waste this time. Oops. So it's going to waste one last time. Let's see. Only to show you that English part, uh, the grammar, uh, it's going to show that this is really bad. Oh, okay, I will. you can give a try, folks. You can just give a try uh, and analyze it, and you'll see good amount of stuffs there uh, in the website itself. You can show. So now you can use it as a quick tool to show sentiment stuffs. If they want to do it via API, I have shown you this. This is going to be a little difficult one. We have seen it. The UIs, you can definitely go try it. It is showing lots of uh, stuff from the caps. I'm not able to do it. So that's on your. Uh, Match the language API. Uh, sentiment analysis is definitely going to be a good choice. So we saw the demos using Postman uh, with the API key restriction. So how it works, how it works. So the next stuff which we are going to see, again, one of the important thing these days, uh, videos. Everybody talks in terms of videos. Uh, you have lots of uh, CCTV cameras across the city. So you want to do monitoring. You want to do only if there's some issue, you want to record it, all those kind of stuff. Then video intelligence API comes into picture. So the simple way of me explaining a video is sequence of frames. If you have an image, uh, I guess you would have played this game in your childhood days. So you would have had a trump card or some kind of a stuff when you continuously played, you'll see the image moving as if like a person walking, this kind of a stuff. It's nothing but 100 cards. So you will have frame by frame stuff. And if you quickly uh, use that, it's going to show as if like a person is moving from left to right or right to left. Uh, so it's the same concept. So sequence of frames are nothing but a video. Now a frame is nothing but an image. So whatever I can do it in a video vision API, the same thing is what I can apply it in even in my video intelligence. So meaning in a video, in, in an image, if I can detect a face, if I can detect it as uh, Taj Mahal or it's a Paris uh, as a hotel in Las Vegas, I can do the same thing on a video also. So extracting the stuffs and identifying what is happening in that specific screen or in that frame. Um, this could be really helpful. Uh, I have done this kind of an implementation for an ad agency. So the requirement was uh, IPL or any kind of uh, event, sports event or any kind of uh, TV shows, right? You'll have ads. That's how they generate revenue. So uh, the ad agency, for example, if it's an IPL and if there's an ad from uh, Coca-Cola or Pepsi, now they are going to pay this uh, broadcasting organization how many times they have paid the uh, how many times the ad has been shown now who's going to count it 10 times the ad came pepsi ad came 12 times uh, the coca cola ad came who is going to count it so for this what you can do is send the recording to video intelligence api and every time when the logo comes, Pepsi ad or a Coca-Cola ad comes, it's going to add plus one, plus one, plus one. So at the end, you're going to get a complete details. Send it to a small system where it can identify, can then can do some aggregation. Then if it's 12 ads, Pepsi is going to show and you have a proof. Pepsi is going to pay X amount of dollars to this uh, broadcast agency. So this could be a good choice of doing it. So I had also tried uh, doing this, but uh, I had to leave that organization in the middle uh, where in an ad, in an ad, you wanted to show whether this is going to have a, a cake, a chocolate cake, a cake which is having a chocolate oozing out of it. So those kind of stuffs you wanted to identify uh, if this ad is having a cake or not. That was also possible using a video intelligence API and uh, uh, NBA, uh, uh, the, main, the most popular base basketball uh, game in the US, we're trying to work with uh, Google to generate highlights of the game. 
using media intelligence api so what is this logic basically so if it's a basketball game um it may be for 60 minutes or 45 minutes i'm not sure of the duration nobody wants to watch a complete game so they want to find the highlights what could be a highlight in a basketball so a ball going out of a, a boundary which is a, a fault or foul whatever it is and a basketball getting into a basket so two seconds before this event two seconds after this event now if it's a 30 minutes recording or a 60 minutes recording these events ball crossing a boundary a ball uh, going into a basket two seconds two seconds now it's going to be roughly 10 minutes of highlights so i can generate quickly a highlights using video intelligence API. you can do the same thing for cricket also so a ball hitting a stumps a ball in a hand or a ball crossing a boundary so if you do this you can generate highlights of the game quickly so n number of use cases you just need to come up uh, look uh, for it and then then you'll be able to figure it out basically. So those are some of the APIs which you get pre-built. You are not going to build it by yourself. The data is already used. The Google has used its own data, publicly available data, which has no consent and build this model. But we know if we upload a damaged uh, carton, it was not able to identify it it is damaged so it has its own limitation because what they would have trained is they would have trained only to identify the object not to classify it uh, damaged or not damaged so if you have such kind of a limitation then you have to definitely use a different one meaning you have to provide your own data and train the system so what google has done is with their data they have trained it now if you want such kind of a stuff the option which you are going to use is called as auto ml so more on this auto ml once we come back from a break and we'll explore how auto ml works and you for most of the pre-built apis you get an auto ml version of it uh, auto ml vision uh, auto ml vision auto ml natural language api auto ml translation auto ml uh, video intelligence uh, i guess for speech to text also should be there maybe i have not updated it so you get an auto ml version for most of them under your artificial intelligence so vision video intelligence translation uh, speech to text is not there natural language so let's explore this once we come back from a 10 minutes break so take a break and come back this conference will now be recorded so before the break, we saw all the predefined APIs which Google provides where it's just access them via REST API. That's it. Remaining every magic, Google is going to do it. But in some cases, like the one which I showed you before the break, where if I have a requirement, I want to find out damaged patterns, so I cannot do this. Or I wanted to find out a more uh, relevant one uh, as Every supermarket these days have uh, a CCTV camera at the entrance. Now, if I I don't want to have a, a human sitting and monitoring whether they are wearing mask or not, I don't want to do that because uh, I can use that manpower for something more productive somewhere else. So instead of that, I already have a CCTV camera and I can use some kind of a video intelligence API, auto ML video intelligence API, where it's going to take the live stream analyze that and find out whether the people who are entering the supermarket are they wearing mask or not so anything of that sort so where there's a customization required and you don't have the skill set to build this but you want the system to build it if you can provide your own data so your training data the data is the most important thing folks when it comes to machine learning so uh, if you have good data Believe me, the remaining part becomes very, very easy. So data scientists spend a good amount of time generating a data. Sometimes if they don't have a data, they create a data called a simulated data or synthetic data. That's the most pain point actually. So creating the data, or like once the data is there, building the model for them is going to be easy because that's their bread and butter. They are able to do it. But getting the data itself is a problem. Now, if you fall into the other category, you have data, but you don't know how to build a model, 
auto ml solutions are going to be good choice cloud auto ml is going to be a good choice and you get various flavors of it where you pass your data to your auto ml uh, various services vision natural language translation video intelligence so where it's going to do a training deploy the model and it should be ready for evaluation and serving your request so this is how the entire process works so let's take a simplest example uh, in the current time people wearing masks or not so i've already done this in the youtube so i can share that video you can look into it at a later point on the complete process but i'll walk you over because that model building takes uh, more than one hour or so so i'll show you how it has been done quickly and i'll walk you over the steps which i have done okay so so you need to have a data you need to have a data so my requirement is i'm not able to identify whether it is damaged or not it just stays box this is not enough for me so i want to do a classification so what i will do and this is going to be an image or people photos who's wearing mask or not wearing mask either one of the use cases i want to do a classification so i'll come to my uh, artificial intelligence category vision so this is because it's going to be a image only so i'm going to use the auto ml vision feature so let me see whether the apis are enabled yes it is enabled what i am going to do is uh, lots of categories which you get object detection just finding an object itself maybe there are certain things which uh vision api cannot even detect it maybe a semiconductor uh in a semiconductor chip uh one pin is broken so if it's not able to identify that kind of a stuff uh, you may need to use your own uh, object detection uh, model with your own data uh, if you want to classify the image damage not damage this is dog this is cat this is uh, cow something of that sort if you want to do something your own thing you will use vision uh, image classification so this is what we are going to use basically so enable auto ml vision api so let me enable this enable get started with a building an auto ml vision classification or object identification model so getting started i get a screen like this where i create a data set so give a name bad six ds data set now what kind of model you want to build so single classification uh single label defective not defective uh wearing mask not wearing mask something of that sort single or multiple labels uh defective non -def uh, non defective partially defective fully defective something other so you have multiple labels to classify the last one is detecting an object uh, something which the pre-built api is not able to do it so if i take single label i just want to find the car is defective or not the carton uh, damaged carton or not people wearing mask or not something of this sort one single label classification is enough for me so i'm going to create a data set Once the data set is done, this is the most important thing, folks. You may be asked a question on this also. When you are building a model, minimum you have to upload 100 images, 100 images of a uh, box which is in a normal form, 100 images at least, which is going to be of damage, so that you will give good amount of samples to your uh, model to build so this is very important each label should have at least 100 images i'm going to put this in the exam cheat sheet possibilities are there it may come and i'll put it in the implementation also people will ask customers will ask i want to do this how many samples you need so minimum at least as per the google's recommendation so is for building 
ऑटो एम एल विशन फॉर बिल्डिंग अ मॉडल मॉडल यूजिंग ऑटो एम एल विशन एपीआई even in the exam it could be important uh, so you upload and again our google cloud storage comes into picture now you see everywhere google cloud storage so it works as your environment staging environment so you upload it and then you click on continue you should be able to see the images which has been uploaded and you can also label them you can label uh, now if you have not labeled the images as this is defective not defective you can label it here explicitly then click on train this train process is going to take roughly around uh, minimum 30 uh, one hour basically afterwards it's going to help you to evaluate you just do the evaluation whether the model has been built very properly or not or you have to give more data and start using it and this is what has been mentioned in the slide also train deploy and uh, evaluate sorry train evaluate and once everything is all good so you deploy it and serve it for apis so and you should be able to get the stuff this is the entire process folks basically you are not writing a single line of code anywhere you have the data you upload it you wait for the system to build it instead of a data engineer building a model for you you are relying on a system and please remember this process is going to be a little expensive. Uh, so I had done this demo called as if you go to my website and search for mask. Uh, so last year, I sorry, nine months back I did this. So where the system detects, the system detects, uh, so, So the system tries to detect whether the person entering a supermarket or anything is wearing a mask or not. So this was completely built using Cloud ML Vision. Uh, uh, using Cloud ML Vision. And this one I used uh, a free trial account only. You can also give a try. I have also mentioned the source. What was the source which I used? It's in the GitHub. You can go download it and you can give a try with this source so the images are mentioned so if i just go to the images so people wearing mask not wearing mask uh, that image is mentioned you unzip it load it you should be able to do it so but here you're not paying it to a data engineer scientist which is one of the most uh, highly paid job so you are relying on a service so you cannot expect the service to be cheaper it's going to be a little expensive and what I did as a mistake, right? I have also done a video on that. You can look into it. Uh, I did not stop this model. Uh, you have to stop the model if you're not using it. I did not stop it. In one week or so, uh, the $300 was fully exhausted, folks. It was fully exhausted. So uh, make sure if you don't need the service running, disable it or stop it. That's very important. So what I would have done in this is, I'm just going to do a fast forwarding. So, so if you upload people, so I have photos with people not wearing masks, wearing masks. So if I try to upload a child's photo, the same vision API, it will say it is a child, uh, a toddler, but it will never say the child is wearing, uh, is wearing a mask or not. So that's the limitation of the vision api again so it shows the child is in a happy mood it's a child all those things but it will never say the mask part because it's not trained for uh so same is the case with this person it shows he's wearing a headwear or he's wearing a tie or anything but not the mask part so what we do is basically enable the api like how we did once you enable the api uh you use your auto ml get a sample data so i did not get 100 images i used my google uh, image search itself to get sample 30 people with wearing a uh, mask not wearing mask i created a data set uploaded it same thing single label classification then go 
upload those uh, sample data which I have. Uh, it's going to show basically the stuff, something like this. You can label. So you can also in the CSV file, I have a CSV file where I do a tagging. This image is for training purpose. This image is for testing purpose. Uh, and this image is having a tag, mask or no mask. So I would have done all the labeling. So if I have done those labeling, it is going to show me something like something like this one, let, something like this first. It's going to show me in my images category, the people wearing. Now you see people is wearing mask. Uh, is there a person? No mask. I have done this. I have done this manual data labeling. I have done it myself by looking into the data. So this is going to be a manual task. So this is called as supervised training. So you tell this is wearing mask, not wearing mask. And there's one more kind of machine learning which people use is called as unsupervised learning. So you don't do any labeling or anything. You just give the data to the system. The system is going to figure it out. So this is supervised uh, learning. So I gave the label, then I will go and basically uh, click on train. So I'll click on train button. Looking at it, it's an 18 minutes video. If you want to look into it, you can just look into the label. It gives me statistics. So I have 30 video images. For training purpose, I'm using 16 videos, sorry, 16 images for validation purpose and to test it out, whether it's really worked or not. This is like more like our exam. So if in the exam, if the teacher says from six chapters, the questions are going to come, uh, they may would have given also a, more, a sample questions also, right? But they will give you something new totally, which is not at all discussed also to test it out, whether you have really learned it or not. So that way, we don't want to train our model with all the combinations, basically. Uh, so you will keep certain combinations for testing purpose, whether to see whether the model is overfit. Overfit is like uh, you give this, it's going to give exactly 100% accurate. So that's like overfit model. So you should not do that. You should keep certain data for evaluation and for testing purpose. So when you click on, Train, you just click on this. Sorry. Now you click on train. This is the part which is going to take roughly around 90 minutes. For me, it took around 90 or 75 minutes. I don't remember it. So, and where you want to build the model. So, whether you want to build this model and host it in cloud itself, this is an important stuff. So, whether you want to host it in the cloud itself or you want to do it on the edge. What do you mean by edge? Say, for example, if you have a CCTV footage, you want to do some uh, stuff, analytics on the footage. Now, the video should not be sent to cloud. The analytics should happen in the footage, it's in the CCTV itself. So that's the edge processing. So, or a mobile. So you download the model. So, and use that model for your prediction. You can do that also. So I left it in the host, cloud hosted itself, so I can use it there. So edge could be really helpful for offline, uh, something to do it at on the edge itself. That's a good option. And this is the stuff budget. Uh, so this was something which I made wrong when I was doing it. I just left this node. This is going to be a node which is going to run and they say the hours of it's going to run. So once you do that, basically the model is going to be built. You will get a notification. Uh, the model is built. It's going to give some statistics. What is the confusion metrics? All those things more of data scientists and data engineer related terms. So basically, uh, what is a false positive thing? Uh, how much if I give a right data, is it giving me the right stuff or not? That's what it's going to give basically. And once you have done this, you can try evaluating it. So now the same trick which I use, I go to Bing, I search for uh, people wearing mask and this is the evaluation of the testing part which I'm trying to do. So I download it from Bing. Similarly, yeah, download it. Download a few other couple of images uh, and this kind of uh, 
image was not even used for training, but the system is, was able to still detect it. And I'll also share the, the drawbacks or the loopholes in the system. It may not be fully efficient, but I'll also show you that stuff. So people, just a people without any mask. So if I download a couple of images, this one, test three. Now, the model is built. I'll go and do the evaluation. So just upload it. So this is your evaluation part where you can upload the image which you have downloaded for testing purpose, which has not been ever seen by the system. Now it gives me a prediction like mask or not mask. 99% accurate, it says this person is wearing a mask, which is really good. So which is really good. Similarly, if I use the other one, it's also again going to say the person is wearing a mask. Now this one, it's going to say no mask, basically. So some custom requirement I was able to do without writing a single line of code. Now you will see in the chat, in the sorry, in the comments, people would have asked question. What if one person and two people enter together, uh, a couple, uh, one wearing a mask, another one not wearing a mask? Is the system is going to detect 50-50? So for that, you need to train the system for that kind of stuff. So if you see my training data set, it was all single photos a person wearing a mask or not. So if you give a sample, like partially wearing, not wearing that kind of stuff, then the system is going to get trained. So based on the data, I can train the system. So if you see uh, it is not working as efficiently you expect, then you have to rely on a data engineer. So instead of directly hiring a data engineer, try leveraging uh, auto ML features. Only if it is not able to do it, then there could be some very specific requirement which uh, AutoML cannot achieve the accuracy, all those things fine tuning because it's a managed service, right? So you will not be able to tune it to some great extent where a data scientist can do some further fine tuning, some very specific niche requirement, then it may not be a good fit. Then you have to hire a cloud uh, data engineer or a data scientist. So that's something on your AutoML. You get flavors for AutoML, basically vision, natural language, translation, and video intelligence. Speech to text is not there for AutoML offering. So speech to text is not there. If I go to my vision is there, video intelligence, if I see, it is auto ML video intelligence, but it is still in uh, preview. Then translation again, this is auto ML translation. So if there are some colloquial languages which you use and you want to translate it, so you can do that. Then Talent uh, solution. This is not AutoML. So, AutoML translate AutoML natural language APIs. And you have a couple of other stuff uh, called as tables. What is this table? Basically, this is more towards structured data. Uh, I guess it is still in preview. So, what does this do? Just a word. That's it. Uh, if you have a structured data, something like a data, data in a database uh, table uh, with all the employee details or the customer details in a bank, uh, and you want to see whether this person can repay the amount or not. So you want to run something on a structured data, rows and columns. So you want to predict whether this person is going to repay the amount or not. You can just load this data. Uh, in a tablet form using auto ML tables, and it's going to predict whether this person has the capability of repaying the loan or not. So it's a supervised learning. The data is going to be in a tablet form, basically. So still in preview, so you will not expect, you cannot expect a question on this, so don't worry on it. So, and there's one more product. So I'm just checking because they keep changing the state from general uh, beta to preview all those things. So doc. Document AI. Uh, let me see whether it is okay. This is another product which you can use basically uh, mostly on documents. 
So now uh, the OCR, which you see, right? Uh, some of the good parts and the bad parts. So uh, seeing this working, not working very well, the vision. So if I can get a PDF document, uh, scanned PDF. Let me try getting some sample image. Uh, PDF uh, prescription. Yeah. Something like this was. Uh, a doctor prescription, uh, which we cannot even read it. So let me try to download this. One dot PNG. Now, if I try to upload this into my Vision API, because it's a human handwriting, it's a human handwriting, and not computer uh, typed. So you will see what's going to happen with this. So it may not do basically the complete text recognition. So some few things it has to some extent. So this part. To some extent, it has tried to do it, but sometimes the overlay is going to be too much. You cannot even detect it. So it is going to fail. In that cases, people use this document AI. So I guess uh, there was a LinkedIn post also recently saying that bye bye to your uh, OCR technologies. Go use AI uh, or document AI. So using which you can upload any kind of human related text or basically a computer type text. It's going to do a complete OCR layer by layer and can be exported into a, a data warehouse usually. So we were working actually on a use case where it is from um, insurance agencies, uh, TPAs, all those things. So they upload the scan. So they want to process this and dump it into BigQuery. So AI document AI was really helpful. So this is going to be primarily for healthcare kind of industry. So where lots of document digitalization, uh, this could be really helpful, basically. So that's something on the auto ML stuff where you still don't write a code, single line of code, everything built by the system, you have a data. Now let's see one more option. If I have a data in a data warehouse like BigQuery and I want to basically uh, run some machine learning model. Usually if you say like this, the data scientists, what they will do is they will take the data from that warehouse, query it, get it, build a model and show the output. Meaning data duplication is going to happen because you're taking the data out of the warehouse bringing into your uh, AI system and doing it. But with BigQuery ML, right, in place machine learning, you can do it. And the beauty is if you do it in place, meaning how can you query your BigQuery? You're going to use your SQL, right? You're going to use your SQL statements. For the first time, you don't need to know a Python code. So if you know SQL itself, that's enough, that's enough where you are going to build a machine learning model using SQL language. That's a beautiful feature which you get in uh, BigQuery M. Very few data warehouse has this capability, folks. Very few, one or two maximum, maximum three is what I would say. One is BigQuery, the other one is Vertica, Snowflakes to some extent. Uh, so very few products, data warehouse has this capability. And you're not learning anything new. You know already SQL. So you're going to create basically some kind of a user defined function and you're going to get this stuff done. So uh, some of the capabilities which it supports, uh, supervised training, meaning you say, for example, uh, the different types of supervised training, uh, just giving you some small insights into it, that's it. So this is usually going to be some terms used in your uh, machine learning engineer and data engineer courses. So at least get an idea of it. Uh, linear regression. What is this based? Basically, uh, this is a supervised training. So where you're going to predict basically uh, whether my sales is going to increase or not based on your historical data. That's it. 
So linear regression for forecasting your sales stuffs. You have one other kind of uh, supervised training, binary logistic regression. This is for classification. The example of wearing mask or no mask. It's basically a, a binary logistic regression, true or false, kind of a classification. So you can also have multi-class. So wearing mask, not wearing mask, partially wearing mask, uh, uh, something or that. So multiple classes you want to do it, you can do it. So that's basically your different types of supervised training which you get. So this is nothing specific to GCP. These are the terms which they use, linear regression, uh, logistic regression. These are all used terms in uh, machine learning stuff. So there is also a kind of training called as unsupervised training. So meaning you don't give any labeling, you don't do any label. This is masked, no mask. This is damaged uh, carton. This is un not damaged. You don't do that. You just upload the data. The data is going to be uh, segmented, clustered, and it's going to identify the stuffs for you, predict the stuffs for you. So this is going to be really a cool one, I would say, because less of uh, manual works. So more is what you are going to rely on the model itself to do it. So one of the popular uh, options in uh, unsupervised training is called as K-means. So that's an option. So BigQuery supports all these things. So usually these stuffs are done in Python, but BigQuery supports all these things, meaning everything you do it in SQL, it's, you're not going to learn Python. So if you're a person who's very comfortable with SQL and definitely data, BigQuery is going to be a good choice. So you can do machine learning with BigQuery SQL statement itself. You don't need to have any model built using Python. You don't need to learn Python basically. So which is really a cool option. Let's see a small demonstration uh, on how this works. And I'm not going to build this. I have a URL which the Googlers have built. We can see that how it works. So how it works. So if you search in the net also query it smart, you will get this link. So it is also available in my bookmarks. You should be able to see it. So if I go to Query it smart. Hope the website works. Sometimes it is going to be down. Hope it works. Hope I can get this time. For some reason, I'm not able to do this. I don't know what is happening. I have to get this. Uh, just a minute, folks. Uh, let me stop sharing for a minute. Maybe something to do with my settings let me just oops Awesome, good. So now if I go to this, uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, Wikipedia is for textual contents. Wikimedia is for all uh, image, textual, uh, sorry, uh, multimedia contents basically. So I'm going to use Wikimedia as a common. So what I'm going to do is image, uh, find similar images, find similar images. <clears throat> So I'm going to use this calculator to find out, find me similar images like a uh, calculator fun, 1 million images stored in Wikimedia. So, or if you want to have a different one, you can try something different. It's going to show, if you don't like calculator, you can give a try with something else. Yeah, ship, we'll try it. So now it is trying to find something very similar like this. Uh, 
and the SQL statement which has to be executed. The model is already built in this uh, in the query, and the statement which they use is this kind a slightly a complex query. Uh, to some great extent, the correlation or the comparison is good. So this is the image it has found from uh, one million plus images, almost like. 11 GB of data in 17 seconds, it has found similar images like this. This all things, image, similar images has been done in SQL folks. Doing it in Python, no big deal. Everybody can do it. But doing it in a SQL is a cool part which can be made available using your BigQuery stuff. So this is your BigQuery ML stuff. So this is more on image. You can do the same thing on a textual data also. So predicting basically. So instead of auto ML table, right? If you want, if you have your own data, you want to play around with it in BigQuery, you can use auto ML, uh, sorry, BigQuery ML. Or if you don't want to build any uh, model yourself, auto ML table could be a good choice. Could be a good choice. So that's something on BigQuery ML. Any questions so far, folks? Any questions so far? So what we have seen is predefined. AutoML and machine uh, BigQuery ML. So in the pyramid or in the triangle, we have seen few of these things. So if there's no questions. Let's move to the the last part. Uh, the last part, which is basically the uh, data engineer or the cloud data uh, scientist who can write a model from the scratch. You need to just provide them the infrastructure, whether it is going to be managed by Google or you are going to manage it. Uh, you can provide a couple of solutions here. Uh, one is the AI platform. So here, Kubeflow, uh, I'll talk about that in just a high level. So I don't have a slide on Kubeflow, uh, Kumar. So, uh, and it's not, Relevant uh, is what I understand uh, from the cloud architecture. So just gave you that insight that Kubeflow is going to be helpful if it's basically ML ops. Okay, so ML machine learning engineer there, it's going to be helpful. So for a cloud architect, just aware, being aware of that is good enough basically. I don't have a slide actually. So but these are something which is going to be part of your uh, architect stuff. So maybe tomorrow or day the la next week I can try to put some slide and show you if you are interested in it. So coming to the AI platform, previously it was called as cloud uh, ML machine, uh, cloud machine learning engine, MLE. If you see somewhere, it is nothing but uh, AI platform. They renamed it. Basically, this is for a service to enable developers and data scientists to build any kind of model, supervised, unsupervised, and also productionize it also productionize it and it supports good amount of machine learning frameworks frameworks uh, the most important thing is tensorflow this is very important uh, because tensorflow was open source by google so they provide a managed version of it uh, here and you can also use some other machine learning frameworks uh, in this it is supported like scikit-learn keras xgboost all those things so this TensorFlow word, at least from the exam perspective, is going to be helpful uh, because there is a case study that helicopter racing league, they talk about TensorFlow. They want to build a model using TensorFlow enterprise version. So our TensorFlow 2.x version is what they mentioned. So at least being aware, if you want to build a model using TensorFlow, meaning your auto ML will not come into picture, your predefined APIs will not come into picture. So you have to use AI platform or the previously called as machine learning engine uh, stuff. So where do you see those things? Yes. Basically, uh, if you see your, you have two options, AI platform, unified AI platform. So unified is going to have some more options. So under AI platform unified, if you go to notebooks, I'm just closing this things. So if you go to AI platform notebook, 
it shows you also a message migrate your notebook we had seen this in our last class how the ai platform notebook works basically a virtual machine it gives you jupyter notebook uh, interface you can play around with it so by default it relies on compute engine api now recently google has done some upgrades they have created a new api called as notebook apis so this is what will be showing even in your uh, uh, in your GCP console. So if you just look into this details, so there are two ways to create notebooks. Uh, who knows, they may ask questions on this. Uh, so use AI platform notebook API. This gives you the most up-to-date features and functionalities. Use Compute Engine API. A AI notebook instance created using this method is called legacy instance. So more towards the API part. So I don't have notebook APIs enabled. So if you want to verify it, just go to your libraries. Search for notebook. So it very clearly shows the API is not enabled. So if I enable it, I can use the latest feature as per the documentation. So let me just enable it. So any notebooks if I use now, it's going to have uh, the latest notebook API stuff. Now if I go here, refresh it, it should show API is enabled. That's how the screens are connected. Yes, it is showing as enabled. Now you create any notebook. And the most important thing is, these two things folks so you create a jupyter notebook with tensorflow and tensorflow is open sourced so anybody can use it even in aws you can use it now google provides you something called as tensorflow enterprise also so the latest version of tensorflow should be something like 2.x The latest version uh, is 2.5. In the notebook, you get 2.4 as a latest version. So 2.x. And you also get an enterprise version. So you're going to get some support for it. So two options are possible. So if I just use this one, let me use the enterprise version of it. And TensorFlow with GPU or without GPU, that also you get it. With, without why it is showing something like this let me just i don't know what is this line uh is it a bug oh like something like this okay with and without gpus also it shows so this part is important from one case study which is the helicopter racing league the helicopter racing league is lit more towards AI. Again, as I mentioned, we'll talk about it. I just wanted to highlight why Mahesh is talking about a tensor flow, which is not at all relevant to us. If you think, just to substantiate that, I'm just sharing that information. Uh, professional cloud architect. This one, this is really heavy on AI. Uh, so if I search for tensor flow, they also say run, race prediction because this is going to be some kind of a league, right? Race prediction can be are performed using TensorFlow running on a virtual machine in the current public cloud provider. So this they are in a public cloud, uh, AWS or Azure, so not in GCP. So if they want to run the same thing in GCP, so TensorFlow running on a virtual machine, which is nothing but what notebooks notebooks and they are not mentioned any details about the tensorflow basically a notebook with tensorflow enabled so maybe one of this tensorflow 2.4 or uh, enterprise version of it use one of them then also they will also mention somewhere uh, gpus gp uh it's not that I remember seeing it. Uh, okay, if it's not there, it's fine. Okay, if it's not there, it's okay. So you get the, both the options. So 
VM to VM. So definitely it's going to be a little easy. We'll talk about a little bit about migration in our ninth module. So AI platform notebooks should be the one which should strike you uh, during the exam when you see something on uh, this part, when you see TensorFlow running on a virtual image or on a virtual machine. So this is how you can connect it. So that's the reason I'm trying to highlight this basically. So you get this option. Now, once you have built your model, so you use your AI platform notebook, which is nothing but a managed Jupyter notebook. You write your model, very complex model. You build it. Now, after the model build, you need to basically do the save the model. So you have to keep the model somewhere keep the model and serve it also. So if I just, so you will also provide an endpoint. You first save the model in the cloud. You'll have an endpoint. You will do some predictions, batch predictions. So these are all things which is supported. This is like, I would say, suite of AI capabilities, which it provides. It's not only to build a model, but also save the model expose it as a endpoint and do predictions. So you can all do this with AI. So prepare your training data set, train your model and do the prediction. So let me enable the API. So the API is now enabled. And if you see AI platform is a regional resource. AI platform is a regional resource where you want to create your model or you can also import it. So model would be built and you create the model and save it here. So now you see it here, folks, advanced training. So you are basically keeping your model, uh, the model which you have built using an uh, custom training. So advanced level using TensorFlow, scikit-learn, all these things. So AutoML Edge is also possible if you want to store it. That is also possible. So <clears throat> that's one thing. And once the model is there, you can also create endpoints. So endpoints are the machine model made available for online prediction request. Endpoints are useful for timely predictions for many users. Basically, you create an endpoint and use it. And batch predictions, basically, you upload a data to a Google Cloud storage. It's going to give you the batch. So in like in bulk. So you have lots of images. We have taken photos from your supermarket and wanted to know how many people came without wearing a mask. You just upload it. It's going to do something like in bulk. If you want quickly to do it online, you send a request, you get a response. That's going to be basically using endpoints, basically endpoints. So let me add these things. It could be really helpful uh, hey, from the example. So our machine learning models for online prediction request. You send, I get it. Uh, The second type which you get is basically batch predictions uh, for bulk uploads. So batch predictions. For bulk prediction with data stored in GCS. And AI platform notebooks, sorry, not notebooks, AI platform model, uh, model batch prediction endpoints, uh, uh, endpoints and batch predictions. Just being aware of this is going to help you out. So these are all uh, regional resources. 
that's what it indicates basically i'll do the formatting later so that's what it indicates now uh, one of the option um, if you see uh, we were doing labeling ourselves like label it as mask not mask all those things you get also an option called as uh, labeling task labeling task now you may see why covid is coming into picture here the reason why it is coming is this is basically going to be done by a human there are some jobs basically where people do this kind of data labeling jobs so you upload as a customer you want to do some kind of a labeling data labeling you have maybe like thousands of uh, images and you want google to help you out in this case what you do is you create this task upload it and there's going to be a charge for it and behind the scene a human does this it's not a, a system which is going to do a human is going to find it out and label it so this is data labeling stuff so and you get it as a part of your ai platform uh also as a standalone service as a standalone service uh under your artificial intelligence called as data labeling. The same stuff, data labeling. Uh, so you enable this API, do the stuff. It's the same stuff. Now, I had a bad time with uh, data labeling uh, in one of the organizations where uh, the customer was trying to do compare between GCP and AWS uh, data labeling feature. So, the person uploaded the data for enabling the data labeling. So, so in AWS also you have something very similar. So in AWS, I guess in uh, two hours or three hours they got the data labeled. So, but in GCP, uh, because at that time the product was still maturing enough, it took two months plus. But they still did not get a response from Google uh, for just price. So some products you will have something like this. So you have to reach out to Google, even though you may not get response. So sometimes you may have it. So it also depends on the kind of support, all those things. So please be aware of it. So know both the good part of it and the black, the, the dark side of it also. You should be knowing how, about that. So I had a great issue with this product. Uh, so, but this behind the scene is done by a human. Remember that. You can also mention the instructions what you need to do all those things so you give those stuff basically so if you see in your ai stuff so i guess we have covered most of them recommendation api if you want you can also turn it on this is going to be basically to do some kind of a, a recommendation stuff without you writing a code so go enable it any uh, do some recommendation it could be for a product or something like how you get it in your uh, amazon something very similar if you want to have a recommendation for your website you can do that and you don't write a code here it's all driven by ui and you also have one more uh, api called as uh, retail i have not explored it folks uh, um, I'll see it tomorrow and let you know about the retail part. One last thing which I wanted to show is this talent solution. Now, uh, this is going to be useful. So, if the customer is going to be something like Nokri.com, uh, Monster.com, job hunting, uh, uh, job portals. So, where they wanted to search for talents. So with machine learning capability in it, uh, you can use this talent solution. So job posting kind of stuff. This is going to be really helpful. So very few organizations who are into this sector, they use this. Some products are specific to a sector, actually. So they have some uh, capability enabled and everything is again based on AI stuff. So job postings, all this, and say, for example, very simple. Uh, Everybody would have done this uh, in nowcree.com, right? If you upload your resume, uh, you still need to update your uh, skill sets. You are good in GCP, you are uh, intermediate in AWS, uh, you are an expert in uh, Azure, something like that, you should view that. But you would have 
thought, why can't it extract all this information from my resume itself? It cannot do that. So, but talent API can do this kind of a stuff. Extract those entities. First of all, you upload a textual file or a PDF content. Uh, it's going to do a OCR, extract the content, find the entities in it, and have some machine learning and build a profile for you automatically and make it more uh, easy for someone to post uh, or update their uh, stuffs there. So that's where this comes very handy. So on the retail part, maybe I'll check it tomorrow and let you know. So I have not explored the retail part. Uh, recently added. Let me see whether it is. What is the state? Is it in? Yeah, it is in preview. So OK, that's the reason I did not even uh, see that part. So if it's in preview, no need to worry about it. So basically, those are the stuff. So. In the beginning, the previous version, it was very, very high level. So, but now I hear in the new version, they have added some more questions on AI. So better know all the products. So all the products which is generally available, we have gone through it um, and we have done some demos also, but they will never ask for, forget about cloud architect. Even if you take some machine learning, uh, machine learning engineer, a data engineer certification in GCP, even in that certification, Google will not ask about any code. That's something which they have made as a good standard. So you are never going to be tested on your code skills. So um, so in such kind of an advanced, in such kind of a specific specialization, if they don't ask the code, even in your architect, they are not going to ask how to build a uh, model, write the code for it all those. Then I'm never going to share that, ask that question. So don't worry, but as a cloud architect, you should be aware what are the services which is available. So if it's something more on audio, speech to text, if it's something on something on a video, you want to do something with a CCTV camera, some customized requirement, auto ML uh, video intelligence is what is going to be helpful. Uh, who knows, they may ask a question, something very similar to this NBA game. Want to generate the highlights of a game, uh, XYZ game, what could be the best product? Auto ML video intelligence. So that kind of a stuff, maybe product based questions is what you may get on AI. Basically, be aware of it, all the various provisions. So that's it, folks. That's it on our uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the shortest module which we ever had in our course, uh, because this is only at a high level. So the, even the high level took us two hours or two and a half hours. So any questions on the AI part, folks? Any questions? And cube flow, if you see it, you will not even see it. You will not even see it, basically. Um, and that's the reason I did not even go deeper into it. So what is there here? I wanted to talk much there. Um, So if you want to use Kubeflow, you have to run it on a Kubernetes cluster and get it there. Basically, that's how you are going to do it. Uh, yes, no, folks, be very quiet. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Mangesh, for that information. Uh, thank you, Imran. All right, so if there is no questions, we we'll move on to our eighth module. So, uh, which is more towards uh, management tools and developer tools. So you'll see various stuffs in this, which could be used for monitoring purpose, automation purpose, all those things. That's what we are going to see. Products like uh, Terraform and all, we are going to see it here. Even though it is not a GCP product, uh, but I heard, there's some questions on Terra. So being aware how it's going to work is going to be helpful. And I'll also do a demonstration on Terraform. So mostly tomorrow. So today uh, we will cover the basics of it. So before we get into the developer tools and management tools, all those things, I uh, wanted to make certain basic stuff uh, clear here. So 
the stuff which you're going to talk here is going to be usually called as DevOps. Uh, and you may ask, we are not DevOps engineer. We are planning to become cloud architect. What do we need to know here? Would be definitely a question. I'll try to answer that also. And also first, let's understand the DevOps activity. And I have seen these days, the requirements most of the time from the, the job description, if you see, they expect you to be a cloud architect, also a DevOps uh, architect or a DevOps engineer. So having an awareness is going to definitely help you to position yourself in a very good job, basically. So let's try to understand this part. So some of the DevOps concepts will understand what is going to be used usually here. And also uh, towards the end, we'll also understand what is DevOps basically. Uh, is it a job role or is it some tools or something else? We'll also learn that. So some of the terms which will be usually used uh, in this process is CI, CD. What does CI, CD means? Uh, so CI means continuous integration. So what is the basic purpose of continuous integration is? Uh, this is going to have some developer concepts here. So if it's a web application, which is going to be built by three developers. Now the front, the first developer would be doing the front end. The second developer would be doing a middle tier. The third developer would be doing the database part, uh, back end stuff connecting to the database. Now the developer who's doing the front end, that piece, he will first develop it in his laptop. It works nicely in his laptop. But at uh, the moment his code and the developer, second developer code gets merged, the system breaks. The system breaks and they have to fix it. Now they have to do this manually all those times always. So instead of doing, if you can have a practice of continuously merging your code, meaning you finished your work, you commit it to your source repository, something like GitHub, Bitbucket, or in GCP, you have cloud source repository. You commit your code there, then a process is going to trigger and merge it and show you a response, whether the build is successful or not, whether the integration is going to be successful or not. It's going to give you that information quickly by deploying the application onto Kubernetes engine, app engine, cloud run or compute engine, any of the compute options. So this way, if you continuously do it, the integration is always going to be working. It gives you that confidence. The developer is not now worried much. So, and they don't need to do anything manual. All they need to do is just write a code, commit it to a repository, source repository. Remaining everything is going to be automated. So this practice is called as CI. CD has two terms. Uh, so if you are talking to a DevOps engineer, you ask him or her what that CD they mean. So it could be continuous deployment or it could be continuous delivery. So what is continuous deployment is basically uh, the name deployment makes it very easy to uh, get it. So small changes, you do it to production. So uh, when I started my career in 2005, uh, as a developer, I have written code, then I have asked the operation guys to deploy it. And it's going to take basically, uh, even if the smallest change folks, it's going to take one week because it goes through an approval process. Uh, there's going to be a slot allocated to us. Then uh, the operation guy is going to deploy it. We should be on standby mode. If something goes wrong, we help him out and do it. So it used to take uh, weeks to figure, have it, even the smallest to change, maybe a logo, maybe some promotion, I have to do it. So it's going to take time. But with continuous deployment, it's again a practice where even the smallest change, you can do it in an automated fashion. That's your deployment, continuous deployment uh, term. Continuous delivery is having always your code in a uh, deployable state, meaning uh, it has some connection to containers. So if you have containerized everything, all the dependencies are captured very well, it's always ready for deploying. You tell me I'm going to deploy it. So continuously, de continuous delivery is where uh, you keep it in a ready state. So if the manager comes, if they ask, can we do a deployment today? Usually the developers will say, no, we don't have the configuration done. We have to do the tweaking, all those things. But if you have containerized it, definitely you can do continuous delivery. 
So these are some terms which is heavily used by uh, DevOps engineers. Uh, so one tool which could be really a, a, a good tool which is heavily used by most of the DevOps engineer, people who use DevOps activity is called as Jenkins, which is an open source uh, CI CD engine which can do build process, testing, delivery, uh, deployment, all those things very, very easily. It's open source, very, very popular. Uh, and GCP also has a very close product, not exactly a comparison, but a very close product called as Cloud Build, which we had seen in our Kubernetes class to build our container image. So the same thing is what we are going to use it even uh, in GCP if they want a CI CD process in a cloud native form. So maybe uh, some of the case studies, right? They are talking about CI CD. So if they want it in a native form, we will use cloud build. If they wanted it to something like platform agnostic, Jenkins could be a good choice. Could be a good choice. So that's the first basic which I want to talk about CI CD. The second thing which will be usually used uh, is the types of deployment which you are going to use. So there are different types of deployments available. Uh, the first one usually people prefer to do in Kubernetes is uh, rolling update. And most of this DevOps, right? Whenever you say DevOps, Kubernetes somehow comes automatically. Containerization somehow comes automatically, folks. It's very well uh, linked. And I would say uh, the entire DevOps kind of a stuff evolved only because of containerization and Kubernetes is what I would say uh, indirectly. So. So even though we are talking about DevOps, all the things, we'll be taking more examples of containerization and Kubernetes in general. So the types of deployment which we will usually use in Kubernetes was rolling update. And the options which we use in uh, App Engine, that uh, split traffic kind of a stuff, it was nothing but canary deployment. And there's one more option called as blue-green deployment. So those are types of deployments which we are going to discuss here. So being aware of these terms is going to be really helpful. So the first and the most popular one, uh, at least with respect to Kubernetes, is going to be rolling update. So where, what happens basically is if you have version one, version one of your image, you want to have version two of it. What you do is basically uh, your deployment, in your deployment YAML file, the strategy should be by default is going to be rolling up. So if you are having two replicas or two parts, so the new replica is going to create one. So you just want to say G -club, sorry, kubectl apply minus f deployment dot YAML file. If you do something of that sort, what's going to happen is basically uh, a new part is going to be created. So by default, the, uh, the required state is only two replica, but it creates more than that. The reason is you want to have a rolling update. So one new pod gets created, one pod goes down, meaning at any given point of time, you will have minimum two pods running. Whether it is with the latest version or the old version, that is secondary. So, but you will have the desired state, more than the desired state here, then slowly, this existing stuff also goes off and you will have a new pod completely with version two. At any given point of time, you will have two pods running, which can take the request. This is your rolling update. And the blue stuff is usually an uh, indication of an existing image. Green is something which is a new image. So this is your rolling update uh, deployment model. So if you don't recollect this, if I go back to my cloud shell, hope you uh, can slowly recollect it, which we talked about Kubernetes. Three different types of uh, options to deploy uh, stuff in Kubernetes. One is using UI, the second one was using uh, uh, imperative way, the third one was using uh, what? Uh, declarative op show op approach. So. So we had tried something like deployment dot yaml edit deployment dot yaml and we use this auto suggestion option. So I can just quickly show you that part. So you 
max search indicates so this is beyond the number of the desired state so that so you can put it in percentage or in uh, direct numericals so if a huge uh, like what should be the increase in the number of pods so that you can have a rolling update so you will usually mention it as and by default it is going to be uh, 25% if you have 100 it's going to be 125 percent more when you're doing it and what are the number of replicas which will be unavailable when you're doing a rolling update so, so the maximum number of parts that are unavailable during the parts that is also something which you can set and default is again going to be 25 percent so these are some important parameters which is going to help you to do a rolling update in Kubernetes. And people prefer to do rolling update mostly in Kubernetes, all because of the built in capabilities which you get. And if you don't see any strategy, the default is going to be rolling update. That's what we see from the specification here. So just mouse overing on the strategy, it shows it is default as rolling update. This is one kind of deployment. Now, in this, what happens basically is at the end, everything is going to be using version two. The entire traffic is going to be served by version two. Now, you may not be always comfortable to use the version two fully. Maybe you have a requirement where 99% of the traffic should be served by the most stable version, which is version one. One percent you want it to be served by the, uh, the latest uh, latest version, but you are a little skeptical, maybe whether it's going to work or not. If you do a rolling update on version two, if it breaks, you lose reputation and people may go, the customers may go to a different vendor. You can definitely roll back to version one. So you are going to have some time there to do that. So in scenarios where you want to test a small set of traffic, check everything is working fine then you can use a different model called as deployment strategy or a model called as canary deployment canary deployment so what you basically do is uh, if you have four replicas serving 100 percent of the traffic what you do is you will say 75 percent of the traffic should be going to the stable version which is the blue one 25 percent of the stuff replicas sorry 25 percent of the traffic should go to one replica here three replicas one replica so in the same deployment you are going to say how much is what you wanted to serve basically so this is going to be a canary deployment so you can do this in kubernetes using your yaml you can mention it like this so for example in your deployment yaml file this is your 100 percent traffic four replicas served by version one and what you do is you reduce it to three 75 percent stable version has been served version one one percent or 20 sorry one replica or 25 percent of the traffic is going to be served by a new canary deployment which is going to be version two so you can play around with your YAML file in this way to do a canary deployment uh, if it's going to be Kubernetes. But if it's going to be App Engine yeah, or that. Cloud Run, that is built in. You don't need to do anything much further. Just go. These are the default way of doing it in your uh, App Engine and in your Kubernetes uh, App Engine and in your Cloud Run. 
easy to do it easy to do it so that's your canary deployment so make a mind map something like that or i can just do this one add this a uh, simple mapping so, so while while doing the deployment we need to mention like that or while doing the coding we need to mention like that uh, while doing the deployment so you see the kind of object it is deployment so you have two images in your gcr version one version two so when you do the deployment you make sure you have two deployments one serving 75 percent the other one serving uh 25 percent of your stock basically hope that answers your question so you do it at your deployment so you have two images and you split the traffic there and you are also going to use uh, the help of your service your service so you should make sure in your service you split this traffic accordingly you do it it's not only the deployment also your service is going to play a major role so the service is the one which is going to give you the connectivity part so it could be a load balancer it could be a cluster ip or it could be your node port so all the concepts which we learned again we are going to reuse it here so that's your second type of uh, deployment option which you get so if i just do a small mapping so uh, deployment uh, better comp uh, compute option option best suited so if it's rolling update type of deployment so gk is a good one if it's canary you can definitely use uh, canary uh, app engine these comes built in app engine and cloud run they provide you this easy option there's one more option called as blue green deployment. So that's the last type of deployment which people usually do. Blue green. Uh, I would say this one is more like a traditional one. Uh, this is more like a traditional one uh, where blue is the old one, uh, green is the new one. So you have version one running. You want to switch to a new version. This is your. recreate option which you see so this is your recreate option which is not the default option so what you do here is you create a new deployment you have the green version the version 2 running uh, everything now in your service you switch immediately uh, or when you see everything is working fine smoke tested everything you switch the traffic from blue to green so you are going to have identical stuffs, a copy, a load balancer should be one more copy, all those things. So this is more like a traditional approach which people use. So sometimes they call it as blue green. Uh, and uh, if you look into the Internet, you will see some one more strategy called as red and black. Netflix uses this basically uh, Netflix. They use a product in a product, an open source product called as Spinnaker. So uh, which is going to be a multi-cloud deployment tool. So they use a term red and black. It's the same thing, basically. So somewhat very similar. So blue green deployment is a kind of last kind of versions which people use. So whenever you want to do this, so something wrong, you can immediately switch back to your blue. So easy switching back is going to be a good choice. So say, for example, uh, some scenarios like long running transactions. It's good to use blue green deployment. So make sure the complete transaction is completed. Then you switch to the new one. If you do rolling update, right? Uh, it's going to be a little tricky there. Tricky there to handle your long running transaction. If there's a transaction running on and you shut down a pod, the data is going to be lost. But with blue green, you make sure you switch quickly to one from another and any long running transaction first you finish it and then you switch it here so depending on your scenario you may use it and blue green one is going to be really helpful if it is a gk uh, ga sorry 
GCE, your compute engine. So whenever you have managed instance group kind of stuff, it could be a good one. So a new option. So these are different types of uh, deployment which you will be hearing of. And we have already done all the types rolling update canary deployment. Blue green we did not do because it's little uh, oldish. People prefer to use canary or rolling update. Now let's get the actual definition of DevOps. Now these are some terms used in DevOps usually CI, CD types of deployments. We got some idea about it. Now let's understand DevOps. So what is DevOps? So many people will say it's a job role. Uh, many people will say it is a tool like Jenkins, uh, Cloud Build. Uh, many people will say it is a product as such, but actually it is a software culture, folks. It's a software culture and you can search it in your Wikipedia also. So I got this definition from Wikipedia only. So it's a software culture and a practice uh, of working together between two sets of people. One set is the development team. The another set is the operation team. So why these two teams have to work together? Uh, if you have done web application development or have worked with operations and developers, you would have definitely known this problem. The problem is the developer, the code works beautifully in his or her laptop. But the same code, if the operation guy deploys it in a production environment, it fails. The reason is the dependencies are not captured very well. And the developer will say it works in my system. I don't know why it does not work in production. He uh, he points his finger towards the operation guy. And what will the operation guy will say? I have just followed your instructions. I followed it as is, but it is failing. So he's going to point the finger to the developer. It's going to be always a blame game, which they are going to always do. And both the people have different uh, uh, end goals. Developer always wants to have the application built faster. He needs to build it, that's it, fastly, and he wants to deploy it fastly. But when you see the dev operation guy, for him, building something fastly is not a concern itself. He wants something which is more stable. The thing which an uh, operation guy never wants to do is deploy something, it crashes or it is failing to deploy. He has to roll back to a previous version. This is something which he never wants to do. So two different people, two different uh, requirements, so we'll definitely have a conflict. Fastness is for a developer, stability is for your operation. So because of these two different uh, set of people, there was always a clash. So that's where Google started uh, and different organizations also started this kind of a culture. Why can't we work together? So why can't we work together? And one of the important uh, stuff to do this part was containerization, folks. So if you see, we had remember the same kind of stuff which I had mentioned. It works in my system, not in your system or not in production. Could be handled very well if you package every dependencies in a containerized form. So if the developer now containerizes everything, it works in his development environment or in his local system. It also works in production system, the same container image. Now, developer and operation guy are going to work together. They are going to work together. So there's no blame game. So they are going to work together. So first, the developer plans it, the sprints, the agile methodology or the water flow uh, methodology, they are going to plan it. Then they are going to create uh, the applications, the use cases based on the sprint, verify it, basically unit testing. So any application, any component which a developer does, that has to be tested by him, the unit, whether that piece of code is working or not. That is usually called as unit testing. He does the unit testing. And the most important thing is packaging it, which is nothing but your containerization. So if you package it, his job ends there as a developer. So he writes the code, does the testing, everything, and he just commits the code to a uh, cloud source repository, which is going to create a container image using our cloud build or junkets. So now the container image is there. Now it's the turn of the operation guy to deploy this into a containerized uh, environment. So the release, He's going to do any changes specific to the environment. Maybe if it's a production, it has to connect to a different database. 
if it's a dev uh, environment, it should connect to a different database. Some configuration he's going to do and he's going to deploy it. Once he deploys it, he's going to do a monitoring. He's going to do a monitoring of the stuff, whether everything is working fine. If everything is working fine, all good. If something is failing, he's going to inform that to the developer. Now the developer is going to create a new uh, sprint or a new plan, starts developing it, does the same thing, fixes it, and it gets go to releases, release, configuration one. Now you see it's like a continuous chain and they do their activity and they will never blame the others. So this culture became very, very popular. But with this DevOps, right, you see there are two set of people working, two set of people working. And even though it is DevOps, uh, we talk everything so nicely, still there's going to be a little blame, but not to that great extent which you used to see in the beginning days because containerization was not used. And containers became very popular only in 2013 or so. So then in 2013, Docker came, containerization became a uh, uh, hit. Then in 2014, Google launched uh, open source Kubernetes. In 2015, they got, they launched the managed version of Kubernetes, which is GKE. That's where these stuff started. This culture started evolving. Now, but you see still two people. At the bare minimum, one developer, one operation guy. Two people should have a synergy working together. So instead of doing this thing right, what Google did right, they did something much higher. They started giving a term called as SRE, Site Reliability Engineer. So what is this is basically, it is one man army folks, one man army. If you can write a code, you learn how to deploy it also. So that you know end to end. So you don't blame anybody. So if you were to blame, you have to blame yourself. So that was the simplest approach which they brought. Uh, so you will see uh, many times there are good books also in DCP. Uh, oh, sorry, in Google, if you just search it, Site Reliability Engineer. So there are good amount of books which Google has op uh, made it available to everybody. So you can look into that also. So, so it's an advanced level, I would say. So DevOps, usually it's going to be two people in very, very simple terms. SRE is going to be one man army. So where he does a deployment is going to be basically a software engineer. So he knows how to write it and he knows how to deploy it, uh, fix it all those. Easier approach. Now it's all good. So now we understood uh, the DevOps concept, also the definition of DevOps. Now you may ask why I should learn uh, DevOps as a cloud architect. So before to that, why DevOps? Let me answer it and then we'll go to what is the importance of cloud with DevOps? We'll see it. So when it comes to DevOps, uh, you will be more agile. So you have a plan, you are using containerization, CI, CD, all those things. So you'll be more agile, meaning the number of development cycles is going to be shortened. Now I write a code, I commit it. The moment I commit, it's going to be deployed. So it's going to be deployed. I can quickly check whether it is working or not. So now if you take my own case in 2005, when I build an application, I raise a request, a ticket. It's going to be approved by my manager and it's going to be deployed by the operation guy two okay. weeks later. Now, if it breaks two weeks later, because that's the time he has deployed it, I will not even know what I did two weeks back because I would have gone to a new requirement. Now, if they ask me to fix it, I'm going to take little more time to fix it. But if you take the scenario like this today, I write the code as a developer, commit it. Immediately, it's going to be uh, continuous integration is going to happen and continuous deployment is going to happen. And I'll see whether it is working or not. If it works, all good. If it does not, I know what I built recently. It is fresh in my mind. I can quickly fix it. I can quickly fix it. I'm more agile here and I can do n number of deployments, n number of deployments. So you don't need to rely on an individual person now. So it can be automated also. If something goes wrong, you can also roll back to a previous version with the type of deployment model which you are going to use. So things becomes much faster if you use DevOps both of them working together. So the developer will write the code, commit it to GitHub. The operation guy is going to create a pipeline, one-time pipeline, 
the moment he does any changes, it's going to trigger that pipeline and do the stuffs. So that way, automation becomes easier. Development cycle, the, the shorter development cycles, so you can check everything faster. And using this kind of DevOps features like CI/CD, I've seen organizations deploying in a day itself 50 times to their production system. Why they need to do this much of stuff? Because they want to be more competitive. So they do n number of deployments to their production system. So all credit goes to products like uh, or the concept or the practice of CI/CD uh, leverage using products like Jenkins. Now, so far we have seen DevOps related stuff, all good. Now, what does DevOps with cloud has to do? This is what is our interest. So one of the key part with DevOps is that tool itself works, products like uh, Jenkins. So when it comes to products like Jenkins, if you are an organization where you only do deployment uh, only once in a day, so you need to have this tool, Jenkins tool. Now, if you do a deployment only from 10 to 11 o'clock in the morning, remaining or evening, remaining time, we don't need this infrastructure. If you do this DevOps in on-premise, you need to keep your Jenkins always running, which is going to be a waste of uh, resource because you are not going to do deployment uh, in the remaining time. So. When it comes to cloud, from 10 to 11 is what I'm, my deployment is. I provision on the fly a Kubernetes cluster with Jenkins there. I do the deployment. Afterwards, I don't need it. I tear it down. Simple. So when I need, I'm going to do it. Or you want a serverless CNCD process, you can use GCP products like Cloud Build, which is an awesome feature. Uh, and if I want to do some monitoring, there are good amount of monitoring tools which you get. So this makes the life of a DevOps guy in cloud much easier. And that's the reason why we are learning a little bit about DevOps here, a little bit of our develop, DevOps. So we'll stop it here. I have only five minutes. So when we resume back tomorrow, what we are going to do is we are going to do a CI CD process using cloud build uh jenkins i'll show you the steps basically but we'll not do a demonstration i'm not a jenkins there but i'll show you the steps how we do it in jenkins uh you'll get an idea once we do the cloud build part uh so in this demo we are going to play a role of a developer for a short time and we are going to play a role of a operation guy for a short time and we are going to use kubernetes one more time more you learn about kubernetes more you'll be more comfortable with your uh in the during the exam. So that's the whole reason to make you comfortable. So we will see uh, where the deployment, if you remember our Kubernetes class, we used to do manually deployments. If we want to have a new version, we have to do G Cloud build submit. It is going to be uh, pushed to GCR. Then we have to do kubectl minus F, uh, apply minus F, deployment.yaml file. We have to do this. Now, tomorrow we are going to see how this entire stuff can be automated, where the developer writes the code, commits it. Remaining everything is going to be automated. You will have the new versions deployed automatically. So such a kind of a stuff we are going to see in tomorrow's class. So we'll stop it here. If you have any questions, happy to answer. Uh, so I have five minutes. Uh, I can answer it. If you don't have any questions, you can drop up. Um, any questions, folks? Tomorrow we'll talk more on a live demo itself. So where we will talk about Kubernetes with CI CD process, which is becoming important because even in the case study they have mentioned this. Any questions, folks? No questions. It's almost like 13 days, uh, 13, 14 days with the new version. Uh, with the various sources, me looking into it, I have not taken this because uh, I took it in uh, December last year. So I have not taken the, the newer version exam. 
So, but looking at the various sources, uh, people tagging me, I understood it. Anthos is going to be important. Istio is important. Cloud Run, which we explored to a great extent, is important. Um, Secret Manager is important. So Anthos and Istio is something which we have not covered. So I'm planning to do a recorded video um, and I'll upload it so that you can look into it uh, and get the concept. It's going to be on the same path. And now you would have had an idea how to, how, uh, how I paste the content, so you should get an idea. So Anthos and Istio, I'm going to create as a separate recording book and upload it so that you get used to it. And when any question comes, you should be in a position to answer it. So this is a new addition. And uh, networking, BigQuery, we have done a deep dive. So shared VPC, VPC peering, all those things should be very easy to answer, basically. Anything on BigQuery should be in a position to answer. Today we saw about AI, which, Usually I'll cover it. Today we, we went a little, go, little deeper and we have also understood it. The only part which is missing is the updated case study, which I am working on it. You should be seeing it on the last two or three sessions. We will do a demystification. And Anthos and Istio components, I will do it as a recording. Are big data skills good to have as a cloud architect? Uh, at least for the exam perspective, Deepak Bandari, so we may need to have it. Uh, but if you can have this, it's going to be really helpful. Uh, the big query part. Now, uh, with COVID, all those things, people are expecting two people's tasks to be done by one single person. So it's going to be really good is what I would say. Uh, uh, you will have a added advantage over the other person. If the person does not, if the other person comes only from infrastructure, but if you have this skill set, you'll be preferred by than the other person. So it's going to be really good with the current pandemic. It's going to be really helpful as well. Any other questions, folks? Okay, folks, uh, if there's no question, uh, so I'll intimate you when I finish my Anthos recording and it's going to be a recording. It's going to be in your playlist only. So in your batch six playlist only, I'll add it as additional stuff. And I have also one more recording on data, cloud data uh, fusion. Uh, we did one demo, another demo, which I did in the previous batch, which is going to be from a database to a big query that will also upload. So as extra stuffs. So if you are interested, you can look into it. So Anthos and Istio, please look into it. I'll send you a mail also. So before the class, the entire training ends, uh, you should have it well in advance, those things. So that if you have any questions on the recording, you can also ask me that, okay? But I don't want to do it in the class because we are already taking a good amount of time. It's going to be extra again, few more times. So I'll make it as a recording. Uh, only those two components only. Remaining, we will definitely cover in the class itself. So we'll stop it here. I don't see any further questions. So see you tomorrow with more concepts on CI, CD and um, cloud operations tools, folks. Okay, we'll stop it here. Thank you. See you tomorrow.